Hey guys, Mike for Sim Racing 604, and welcome to my unofficial owner's guide for the GTM cars for Assetto Corsa. So I'm going to run you through some of the details, some of the features, some of the sort of tricks to get the most out of owning a GTM mod. Uh, the reason I wanted to do this is because I think these GT3 cars are sort of reinvigorating GT3 racing in sim racing. I think they're phenomenally detailed cars. I think that Racing Studio has put an incredible level of detail and attention into these cars. And as a result, they're some of the most pleasurable cars you can drive. So. GT3 is something that's saturated in sim racing. The last thing any of us thought we needed was more GT3 cars, yet somehow Race Sim Studio has hit them absolutely out of the park and made some of the best cars, period. Not just GT3 cars, but some of the best cars, period, to race in sim racing. So I wanted to do sort of a special owner's guide to help you get the most out of your GTM cars should you choose to buy them. So just as a quick introduction before I start actually getting into the cars, let's talk about what you'll need. The first thing is, of course, Assetto Corsa. This is unfortunately for PC only. If you're a console Assetto Corsa user, I'm sorry, but you're out of luck. This will be for PC only. All of these are paid mods, but the good news is Assetto Corsa is so cheap these days. If you find it on a Steam sale, you can probably have it for about 10 euro or $10 US, including all of the DLC packs. If you get it on its own, it's probably going to cost you $5 or less. So to add on a few of these GTM cars at a few dollars or a few euros each, maybe a little bit more, maybe $5 each, in my mind is still well worth it. So you can get the best, in my opinion, GT3 driving experience in sim racing for roughly that price. But again, it is P PC only and and it's a shocker because sim racing is so saturated with GT3 racing and it's amazing that a sim whose development officially stopped in 2017 but remains cheap and it remains well loved it remains popular has now found a, a new footing in GT3 racing and positioned itself frankly at the top and this is these cars these GTM cars are by Race Sim Studio. Race Sim Studio is a modding team that works, I think, exclusively for us or within the Assetto Corsa community to bring us mods and have done so since 2017. They sort of rose to prominence with their Formula Hybrid cars, which are based on the current year Formula One cars. But these GTM cars, we've we got the first one in 2019. We've got six since, so there's seven now in total, and uh, again, they're they're phenomenal. So it, their move to make these GTMs or GT3s was not a popular one, frankly. I was among those who thought it was a mistake for Race Sim Studio to go this way, but I have been proven wrong. I am more than willing to admit when I'm wrong, and this was one of those cases. They chose to take their company in the direction of GT3, and it has paid off brilliantly. These cars are fantastic, so uh, I was very wrong about their approach approach here I think it has paid off so moving to part two uh, what is GTM and a little bit of history about the cars uh, this is based on the real world GT3 cars uh, GTM a play on GT3 if you turn the M 90 degrees clockwise you'll kind of understand how they landed at GTM so it is GT3 cars and we have seven of them what's what is now understood and this is the end of 2023 when we understood this is that this is pack one so surely there will be more coming and uh, yeah we have seven cars as part of the first sort of wave of GTM cars uh, we got the first one in 2019 with the Bay, Bay Row 6, which is based on the BMW M6. And then COVID happened and all kinds of weird things happened in the world. And Race Sim Studio basically, I wouldn't say took a break. I know they were working hard, but uh, yeah, it was hard to get the team all together enough to really churn out any mods. So we didn't get another GT3 car from them or GTM. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably throughout the video. We didn't get another one for almost a year. So it was November of 2020 before we got the second car, which was the uh, Lanzo V10. And then fast forward through 2021, through 2022 and into 2023. And we have just been getting rapid fire GTM releases from Race Sim Studio. And each of them has been fantastic. So again, ranging from December of 2019 through December of 2023, uh, we now have seven cars. 
And if you're wondering about the naming conventions, there's copyright issues. So because these are paid mods, uh, Racing Studio cannot use the real names. So in place of BMW, you have Bayro. In place of Lamborghini, you have Lanzo and so forth. And uh, they have tagged them each as GTM. It makes it easier to search if you're using Content Manager. Um, and it's very to very easy to distinguish between the classes. Racing Studio also likes to put the engine format in their in the name of their cars for some reason. I don't really understand why, uh, but you will see the uh, engine type, be it V6, V8, V10, uh, in the actual naming of the cars. So I'll go through all the cars in great detail in uh, subsequent parts of this video. Um, but yeah, that's just to sort of understand a bit about the naming conventions and why they have such strange names. It's a copyright thing is the reason. Um, and that extends further. That extends into the liveries. Um, so the liveries, they've got some great ones here, but they're not, well, they're, I guess you could call them based on real world liveries, but they're not actual real world liveries. So you won't see many stickers. I've noticed a Bosch sticker. I've noticed IMB Racewear, Race Lodge. There's a few uh, real world brands that are represented in these cars, but frankly, not many. Uh, for the most part, they've kept them anonymous and fictional, uh, or kept them fictional, I should say. And uh, so that's why the liveries look as they do. Now, thankfully, there is something called Race Department, which allows us to not only download real liveries for the cars, which makes them look exactly like the real world counterparts, but also even down to uh, customizing the tires or changing the tires rather uh, to the real world brands and also changing the names. You can actually get the actual names tagged to the cars so it's uh, less confusing. Uh, so that's free through race department. You can uh, have a search on your own uh, to find that. Um, you will notice that uh, again, this is just the first pack. And if you compare this to the the uh, you know GT3 European series or um, IMSA or um, you know any of the sort of major series that runs GT3 cars, you'll notice that there's some uh, absence. So uh, we are expecting a second wave of GTM cars. Um, you know, conspicuously absent so far, we, you know, Aston Martin, Bentley, uh, the BMW M4, uh, Ferrari 296, McLaren 720S, uh, the Porsche 911. Now, some of these, when I'm saying them, you're probably saying, if you're experienced with a set of course, you're probably saying, well, there's mods for those cars. And this is true. You can get other mods or mods from other, uh, teams to bring those cars to Assetto Corsa. And there's some great ones, frankly, like the uh, Porsche 911 992 GT3R uh, from United Racing Design. Phenomenal GT3 car. I don't know how well it would play with these GTM cars in terms of balance of performance, but it is out there and it is really, really great. Uh, I know they also have an M4 GT3. Uh, they produced a 296 GT3, which I didn't love, I'll be honest. But uh, anyway, all this to say that there are other mods out there. Uh, but hopefully the next wave of GTM cars sees the Race Sim Studio touch applied to these cars. So very shortly, uh, we're gonna go out on track and before I actually drive them, I'm gonna give a detailed walkthrough of some of the features of the cars um, because there's it, it's easy to just jump into these cars and start driving and even though you'll love the driving, you're probably missing a lot of the features of the cars, a lot of the details of the cars that Race Sim Studio worked so hard to bring to us. So I'm gonna go over those details. Um, and the first one, the easy one, will allow me to give my voice a little bit of a break. And that is by showcasing the sounds because in addition to some of the best looking and best driving cars we have in Assetto Corsa, they're also some of the best sounding. Ranging from, you know, the deep throaty V8s to the screaming V10s to um, even a pretty interesting sounding V6 engine in the Acura. So um, a lot of cool sounds to be taken in. So let's take a couple of minutes kind of as a warm up here and uh, enjoy the sounds of these GTM cars. And then we'll go out to the track and I'll talk you through some of the features. And then we'll actually get into driving a little bit later in the video. Okay, so just before we listen to the sounds, uh, there's a couple of things that are important to set up. So first thing, we're going to open up the audio app. We also want to open up our Pure Config app. 
And these settings you see here are what is recommended by Racing Studio. So master to eight, wind and tires at five, all else to 10. Uh, also important in your pure config app, if you go to sound, um, the sound tab rather, make sure you have the sound wind volume interior set to zero. Uh, so that's gonna get you the best sounding cars of the GTM class. You might have to switch this up when you go to uh, cars by other mod creators, uh, but for now this should work for you. So um, yeah, you can go ahead and close those out once you have saved them, if you need to save them, and then you're good to go. So let's take a listen to the audio from these amazing seven cars. So to start off our look at the GTM cars, we're going to first look at the one that was chronologically given to us first. This is the Barrow 6 V8. This is, of course, based on the BMW M6 GT3. It carried, uh, in the real world, the homologation number of 043. That number dates all the way back to 2016. This is among the older cars... Uh, 
in, in the class right now. This is set to be fully out of service by the end of 2023, so very, very shortly you will no longer see M6 compete anywhere. Uh, this one was the successor to the Z4. Now we have the Z4 already in a set of course, a courtesy of Kunos, and this would go on to be succeeded by the M4. This again, the M6 and the M4 GT3 would be the successor to this car. You are looking at a front-engined rear-wheel drive car. Let's swing around to the side here. We can kind of take a look at the profile of this car and see that long front end on this car. That is housing a 4.4 liter twin turbo V8 engine. Uh, you can see the exhaust exiting out the side of the car just behind the front wheel presumably since it is a v8 configuration we should see the same on the other side and indeed we do so again big old v8 underneath that hood and that hood sitting well proud of the uh of the driver you can imagine the driver's body kind of cutting a line like this his feet his or her feet ending just behind these front wheels here front tires rather and then that engine just above the feet above and in front of the feet so interesting profile on this most of the cars we see in gt3 now uh, well i wouldn't say yeah, I guess most, but not all, uh, carry the mid-engine configuration, so you don't see a lot of cars with the hood this long, or the bonnet, if you will. Um, but uh, yeah, this is the general configuration. As you can see, behind the driver, there's a lot of space too, so it's a very interesting looking uh, vehicle. Let's go ahead and kill the uh, engine here, so you can actually hear me. And then we will take a look around the car a little bit at some of the details Race Sim Studio has included. This is, uh, again, the oldest car in the GTM class. Um, so you can kind of, much like you might look at the work of an artist and uh, see their earlier work and see sort of hints of what was to come and, uh, you know, the underlying brilliance. And uh, it hasn't yet fully come to fruition, but you can see uh, sort of tinges, tinges of the artist's brilliance. And that's what you see here. Um, so you can see if we get in nice and close to these wheels, you can see those brake calipers in there, uh, everything nicely modeled, uh, down to the lines on the rotors. That's pretty amazing. If we zoom back out, you can see just kind of marked up tires and, uh, I do believe it carry can't really read it, but I can't tell if that's an official tire designation or not. Uh, but either way. You can see just the fantastic level of detail Racing Studio has put into these tires. And then if we swing around front, you can see these canards here directing air out and probably up toward that massive rear wing, and we will get there. Uh, this toe strap here has been modeled, I believe, when we're driving, that will flip up. Certainly on some of the other GTM cars, uh, because it's just a fabric strap, when the air hits it, it flips up. We will see that in other cars. I don't know if that's necessarily present here, but we can check that out. You can see the incredibly low stance. Let's zoom in here, maybe get right down to ground level. You can see that incredible tight ground clearance there. Uh, the whole car like that, but you especially notice it on the front. They've sat that M6 nice and low. Swinging around to the shaded side of the car here, what else do we notice? Of course, the mirrored canards there uh, from the other side. Little RSS logo where the, uh, I guess, M6 badge would go. And then we see what would have been the BMW logo showing RSS instead of Bavarian Motorwork. And then we swing over top here. A uh, little bit zoomed in there, but you can see these giant inlets here, uh, these NACA ducts here. Presumably all that air is directed, uh, or much of the air is directed to helping cool the engine, but some of that probably, let's see here, these, whoops, too much mic. These two smaller NACA ducts probably directing air toward the driver. We'll have a look at the cockpit in a moment. Little emergency shut off there. You can see if this car were on fire, uh, that kills the power, I believe. And uh, this might be an emergency engine shut off, would be my suspicion. 
You can see the Puma logo. This is a uh, base livery for the car. So we are uh, using sort of imitation sponsors and that is meant to look, I guess, like the Puma logo you would see on the real M6 GT3. And then we come over here. We'll talk a little bit more about this later, but these NACA ducts aren't just cosmetic. We can actually go right in and we'll see where that air is directed momentarily. Uh, these V paintings are something that's become uh, sort of, I don't know, infamous or synonymous with these RSS cars. We'll see that on all the cars. And uh, it's kind of been tough because uh, it doesn't work well with the motion blur in Assetto Corsa, but uh, all the cars sporting this V on the tires to, I guess, let you know when it's rolling, perhaps. Uh, looking profile again at the rear of this car, Man, the, the, the detail on that glass is phenomenal. And then we see this massive rear wing. Um, definitely the GT3 class is not <laughs> afraid of using huge, huge rear wings uh, to get more downforce on the rear of the car. This, of course, hunting for that extra G, uh, excuse me, extra downforce. Uh, big old engines up here. Not much going on back here, which we'll see shortly. Uh, so looking for all the extra weight on those rear tires to help with grip and definitely a big rear wing is going to help with that. Looking again at the rear of the car, another toe strap back here. Uh, you, you can see, whoops. Whoops, here we go, rear diffuser. Uh, you can see it channeling that air straight through another um, BMW logo or what would be BMW logo showing RSS instead. And then the RSS in kind of silver lettering here, maybe supposed to say M6 GT3 uh, RSS performance instead of BMW performance. And then, yeah, the uh, trunk release presumably here. I suspect you would stick a finger in there, pop that and do the same on the other side. And then you would have access to the rear of the car, the rear boot, perhaps. Speaking of, let's go inside the car. We can go through metal. This is a Settle Corsa and see what's going on in here. As you can see, there isn't much. It may look busy, but there's actually a lot of dead space in here. Uh, not a lot going on. You can see the wheel wells here, uh, just a few bolts. That's the only thing breaking the otherwise unblemished surface of this wheel well. I talked earlier about the NACA ducts. Let's go have a look. This is channeling air in. Where does it go? Well, let's go have a look. Uh, can you see that? Not really. Sorry, folks, there's that NACA duct. So it directs it in through this big old black pipe and into that wheel well. So helping cool the rear brakes. Again, looking back at this, you can see all the tubular steel here helping keep things rigid in this car. And that's probably the majority of what's going on in the rear here. Uh, a couple other boxes. This is presumably to take air from the outside and uh, perhaps feed the engine. I'm not sure actually what all these tubes do. Uh, there's one, this tube right here, this black tube here feeds to above the driver, which we'll get to in a second. And um, yeah, I believe it feeds as opposed to returning, but it might also be a return. I don't know. And then it dead, dead ends into this box here or near this box here. So interesting to see all the details that Race Sim Studio has included. All right, let's go up front. We'll start by looking at the driver's view here. As you can see, there is just a ton going on here. Uh, let's F7 ourselves. And then we can have a look. Comparatively simple steering wheel here. We have seen complexity of steering wheels in racing cars just increase more and more over time. Uh, this one keeping it pretty simple. It's got your tachometer bars here. And then just one, two, three, four, five. Looks like 10 buttons total here. Uh, each reachable by the driver's thumbs. But uh, we can't actually do any of that in a Settle Corsa. 
uh, but those are just cosmetic but nicely modeled just the same. Looking over here, we have the main button box there. We see an air intake helping cool the cabin of this. Uh, race cars get incredibly hot inside, so it's not uncommon for them to funnel air or channel air rather into the cockpit to help cool things. Then we have this incredible button box here, nicely detailed um, fire suppression system. Press that and uh, it helps uh, extinguish any fires and we'll see more of that in a second. Uh, this here, you can see it says Sim. That is because I am Sim Racing 604. It has the driver's name. I believe this is your position. Um, so I am in first position because we're just, we're just in practice mode here. Lap zero, and then I think it should show fuel. Uh, let's see, should show 50, I think. Oh no, we, we zeroed out the fuel. That's why it's showing zero. But let's see if uh, I can add some fuel here. And it should show a three in a second for three liters of fuel. There we go. So a nice touch. And this here, you might know it as sat nav, you might know it as GPS, it is actually functional. So you will see when I start to drive this later on in the video, it will actually be accurate. So this time is accurate, uh, fuel level accurate, ambient outside temperature accurate. It also shows race laps, uh, number of cars on the track, and uh, what position I am in. Um, but more importantly, this sat nav screen will actually work. Now I've conveniently lopped off the uh, R or P. This is pace logic or race logic, depending on where you come from, the real world or Assetto Corsa. And uh, it's a nice touch here. So we see these timers in all sorts of racing cars and it's represented here in this bay row. And uh, this is another timing screen here. Can't see it too well just because it's uh, in the sunlight, but we can zoom in on that. Oops, too much. So... I believe this shows lap timing and perhaps Delta. I'm not sure. And then we have our current lap time right now. It's sitting at 16 minutes and 20 seconds. But of course, that will zero out as soon as I cross the start finish line. Then we have our tire temps all around. This is a tachometer bar and these LEDs will light up to uh, this is a tachometer. And I believe these illuminate this, the ones flanking the screen uh, will illuminate when we're in the pits. Uh, turbo pressure, fuel as a percentage. We also have fuel in liters over here, uh, oil and water temp, and then we have our engine map, uh, ABS and traction control gear, RPM, just need one more point of data for RPM, of course, and then our speed. But you can see the fantastic level of detail Racing Studio has uh, put into this. Let's go over quickly and have a look here at uh, what would be our passenger seat. There we go, there's that fire suppression, or part of the fire suppression system down there. All sorts of leads here, nicely tucked away, cable managed. Uh, as it comes through here, breaks out further, I guess. Some of these sneak through the firewall, and then some of them go to a control box here, which has been tagged Race Sim Studio. So just incredible levels of detail as we see here. This is just inside the passenger door here. You see these five buttons and then what looks to be some sort of power plug. So I'm not sure, perhaps this is for charging the battery. I'm not 100% certain about that. These would likely be for not the driver. This would be for the pit crew or perhaps marshals. My suspicion is you can kill the car with these, uh, with these buttons in case there's any sort of emergency or any reason for the team to shut down the car manually. We have another couple of control devices back here. Uh, not sure what exactly these would do, but you can see they've modeled it down to the wire and then all these bolts, all these threaded bolts, you can see the nuts on them. So just incredible levels of detail. Um, these belts, you can see them shaking. It just naturally shakes. It's designed to emulate how they shake when the uh, engine is fired up. Right now it is not fired up. And then having a quick look, that's creepy. Uh, that is the hose I was referring to before. So again, if we go back into the boot here, uh, that hose, whoops, starts back here, sneaks through, and then goes up above the driver's left shoulder. Uh, center mirror, left mirror, and right beer. So that is about it. Let's go back to our driver's view here. We will go back into the pits. I'll just run you quickly through your setup options. As you can see, I've got a couple of, well, 
Do I have saved? Uh, yeah, got a couple saved here. So you can save custom setups. Gearing is fixed, 290 kilometers an hour, theoretical top speed. Tires, there are two compounds, two compounds, just one compound on this Bay Row, just the hard. Uh, some of the other GTM cars will have a wet compound and uh, adjustable pressure, of course. Fuel, uh, this is also where you would find your engine map if the car had it, this Bay Row does not. So all you can do is select your fuel level between zero and 125, I believe. There we go, 125 liters possible. Electronics, traction control, and ABS, just what you'd expect. You do have rear wing adjustment. Brake bias, 67% by default. Diff preload set to 100 newton meters by default. And then we have our usual suspension adjustments. So nothing too serious there. Uh, let's see, did they miss one? Suspension one, suspension two, suspension three, suspension five. Interesting. So maybe they've tried to keep the setups the same through all their cars. And then various, uh, there's no cosmetic changes you can make on this car. But again, huge amounts of uh, customization you could do to the suspension. So that is pretty much it for the Bayro. All right, let's have a look at the next one. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the Lanzo V10, obviously based on the Lamborghini Huracan GT3 Evo. So we had this uh, by Kunos, much like the uh, the M6 GT3. I talked about how we had the Z4 uh, GT3 by Kunos. For this car, we had the Huracan GT3 by Kunos. So this is the uh, real world successor to that. This is the Evo version. So this is the one that really sparked my interest. You know, it was almost a year between the M6 GT3 release and this Lamborghini Huracan Evo release uh, by Racim Studio. So this is the one that really solidified it for me. I thought the Bayro or, or M6, I'm going to call it, uh, was kind of a one-off and it didn't really fit in. I didn't like the direction that Racism Studio was going. And then they gave us this and it just kind of clicked. It just kind of made me think, you know what? These guys are really, really onto something here. Uh, the car is phenomenal top to bottom. Uh, this is the mid-engine, the first mid-engine car I'm going to feature here. So uh, big old 5.2 liter V10 sitting behind the driver here. And, uh, you know, when we looked at the m6 gt3 in profile you saw that long hood that just extended out here uh not so with this lanzo um you know i was uh saying with the with the m6 gt3 we think of it as as you know kind of a long uh unruly heavy thing with this lanzo or huracan gt3 uh evo it just uh, looks like a race car should, in my opinion. I think it's one of the most gorgeous race cars uh, in modern history, um, or in recent memory, I should say. Uh, absolutely beautiful profile on this thing. It looks aggressive, it drives aggressive, it sounds aggressive. Everything about this car is really, really cool. All right, so let's do a walk around here. We'll go ahead and kill our engine. So same thing we did last time. We will start at the front here. More of these canards directing air toward that big old rear wing here at the rear of this Huracan GT3 Evo. Uh, actually, I talked about tires last time, didn't I? So you can see they have branded calipers now. Uh, I think it's, can't see that name entirely. Remember, maybe it's supposed to be something like Brembo. I'm not sure, but same thing. You can see the lines of the calipers and absolutely fantastic levels of detail. Swinging around front here, you see this aggressive nose. And I spoke about how low to the ground that M6 was. Look at this Huracan. Even lower. Incredible. And then big old light bar at the front here. And uh, you might be wondering, what is the point of these if there's no engine under this uh, front hood? Well... If we swing up and around, you can see a radiator, a massively effective radiator here. Uh, they're able to take advantage of the shape of the car and direct air up into this radiator, get cool air going through the system. And uh, yeah, it just... Uh, it's one other advantage of the mid-engine car, uh, besides the better weight distribution, is you can do a lot more things with the air up front. Um, so we're able to, they're able to leverage a big old radiator under there uh, to generate a bunch of cool air. Uh, you can see these releases here. There's one there and then one on the other side mirroring it. 
to pop that front hood. Uh, you can see it would be a Lamborghini logo, but it is an RSS logo with a dragon on there, it looks to be. And then these NACA ducts, you can see something in there, some sort of like filter, too dark in there to see, but that's possibly directing air to the driver. I talked about the toe strap on the last one. This toe strap is definitely animated. So when the uh, when the car is running, uh, this thing will flip up because it's just a light piece of fabric. And then swinging around the other side here, you can see these incredibly, like they even went to great lengths to make the mirrors, the side mirrors. Uh, first of all, carbon fiber. Second of all, uh, very aerodynamic. So uh, you can see these vents here likely intended to help cool those hot wheel wells. Can we see inside there? No, not really, but likely venting that wheel well so that those brakes have a little bit of extra advantage uh, in terms of cooling. Now you can see this hashtag designed by Skyline. That is actually the creator of this livery. So Skyline Design has made some of the best liveries ever in Assetto Corsa, and they lent their talents to this project, which is really cool. Big old Racing Studio performance here. Uh, the website, racingstudio.com. And uh, we have more ducts here. Again, probably used to cool that wheel well, to exhaust heat. You can imagine air coming through there and uh, just pulling that hot air right out. The problem, I guess, is that some of that hot air might get pulled right back into this rear wheel well, but of course the rear brake's doing less work uh, than the front brakes, so it might be okay. Nice style door handle there, absolutely beautiful. Uh, you can see the uh, filler cap here has been welded shut. I do believe the filler should be on the other side. Let's have a quick look here. Indeed, that's the proper filler. So this would be for the uh, US version of the Huracan, but in this case, it's just been welded shut. Um, the engine is under here. Again, these release, I won't fly over, but uh, these release buttons here and here would pop this whole uh, uh, top off here and then you can see uh, emergency escape hatch here for the driver radio comms uh, what is this possibly a camera possibly a radio repeater there's another one over there so lots of little extra details here under this bonnet here is it shaking or is that me uh, let's see can I get in you can kind of get in. I need to go very carefully here you can a little bit see what would be the top of a 5.2 liter v10 engine you can kind of see the makings of it i guess that would be the air intake oh yeah there's the air cleaner okay cool there's the twin air cleaners feeding one feeding each bank and i mentioned i like the style of this look at how deadly that rear end looks Isn't that awesome and it's got these uh the rear diffuser is one thing but look at this piece of presumably carbon fiber that sits off the body to help channel the air better. Isn't that pretty cool? I mentioned previously that the uh, GT3 cars, the GT3 uh, manufacturers, designers are not afraid to use giant rear wings. Look at the size of that. Absolutely massive. Uh, rear toe strap here also represented. A little arrow there letting you know where it is. Uh, a couple more details here. Not sure exactly what these would be, frankly, but uh, they sit adjacent to the... Uh, to the exhaust pipes there. So that's pretty much a tour of the outside of the GT3, excuse me, the uh, Lanzo V10. Let's go ahead and fly into the driver's seat. Actually, we'll go ahead. Uh, driver's view, a lot simpler. There's no sat nav or GPS here. Uh, you got a couple device back with the pace logic slash race logic. Uh, no rear view mirror. There's a rear view camera, whoops. Pull myself over to that side. Why can't I move over there? Anyway, it's a rear view camera instead of a rear view mirror. Uh, this is the same thing as last time, saying my name, saying what position I'm in, how many laps I've turned, and how much fuel I have on board. Very simple uh, 
gauge here, dash here rather, uh, lights across the top, letting you know when to shift or helping you decide when to shift. Uh, probably these lights flanking will tell you when you're in the pit, when you have the pit limiter enabled. And a little bar out here tells you whether you're going too fast or too slow. If I F7 myself here and we look down a bit, you can see that is a wonderful replica of the uh, Lamborghini Huracan steering wheel. And then we look down to the right, this big old button box kind of shifts slightly over that way too much. There we go. You can see that nice button box here, well designed. And we even have cool details like, you can see the quick release on this steering wheel. Look at the detailing on that, absolutely incredible. Uh, GTM RSS 1337, track 1609, uh, just, absolutely amazing like you know basically FIA homologate or FIA inspection stickers uh, represented there you notice IMB Racewear here that's a real world manufacturer of sim gear um, and they have lent their talents and their logo to this car so uh, it gives it that more accurate look that's pretty awesome uh, lots of details still to come on this Lanzo V10 bear with me you can see this would be a Bosch Motorsport. I believe this is the ECU right here. Uh, some sort of hmm reservoir there. Not sure what sort of reservoir that might be, but it is still represented here. You can see the steel support beams across here, helping keep the car rigid. Uh, safety net here, clipped in where? Clipped in just to the left of that uh, intake vent there. And then looking at where the uh, passenger's feet would be, I'm guessing this is the fire suppression system or one aspect of it. Uh, date of service. Oh, I think that should say service. Oh, big mistake RSS. Uh, but everything down to the serial number, it's barcoded, amazing. And then some sort of filter here. Uh, there's the fire extinguisher system. So driver can just reach over. Where's the driver? There's the driver. Driver can just reach over, press that, and uh, begin the fire suppression system. Coming over here, you can see we've got these wires terminating. And then another control system sneaking through the center area just beside the driver's right leg. Absolutely amazing. Oh, we're underneath the, uh, that's why it looks weird. We're underneath the button box here. That's why it looks strange. But you can see these cables coming out of this control box heading off where they go. So just absolutely amazing levels of detail. Oh, yeah, I was going to mention, you see these two GoPros or RSS cams as they're known. Watch what happens when I press F6. That's the first one you saw. That's the second one you saw. So again, have a look at that one more time because I think it's incredibly impressive. Camera, camera. So you have this one kind of facing the steering wheel from basically the passenger's right shoulder and what would be the passenger's left shoulder. So let's have a look at that again. There you go, left shoulder, right shoulder. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I find the uh, level of detail RSS goes to is just incredible. Um, yeah, so. Just, yeah, mind blowing. All right, quickly, let's go ahead and look at the uh, setup options. So theoretical top speed of 284 tires. Again, just the one compound here. I wonder if they will push an update because wet tires are available on some of the cars. Uh, 0 to 125 liters of fuel, traction control and ABS control here. Again, rear wing adjustment. This is pretty much identical uh, to the options we had uh, with the Bay row. So nothing big to look at here, uh, but that is your Lanzo V10. Let's keep it going. So if you were to ask me what is the best of the GTM cars, I would probably go with this. This is the Mercer V8. It's based on the Mercedes AMG GT3. This one came to us in June of this year, June of 2023. Uh, it's a front engine, rear wheel drive car. Again, like the M6 GT3, you can see that long hood up front. And uh, yeah, so it's that front engine configuration that gives it that long nose. Uh, now I said it's the Mercedes AMG GT3. Uh, you might know it as the AMG GT3 2020 or the AMG GT3 Evo, uh, but according to Mercedes website, it's just the AMG GT3. So we're supposed
supposed to pretend like nothing happened between 2015 and now with this car, but this is simply not true. So starting in 2019, they updated the car with some pretty significant changes. So in terms of its overall styling, yes, it's still very much the AMG GT3, but there are quite a few changes in how the car performs and most notably to this Assetto Cor Corsa version the style with which it drives. So this one feels much more spry. It feels much more uh, alive underneath you. Um, but still the basic, I mean, compared to the Lanzo that we we're just looking at, it's a very uh, basic looking car. So front engine, uh, big old long hood here. Let's uh, start our journey. Actually, let me shut the car off first. Apologies about that. You can see we have engine map there, but we'll get to that soon. So swinging around front here, you can see these yellowed lights. That's pretty cool. So depending on the configuration you choose, uh, you can have different colored lights on these cars. So pretty awesome. Uh, these are also illuminated. These are your uh, endurance lights and uh, hate to keep delaying, but we will get to that too. So the trademark of this Mercedes AMG GT3 car uh, is this big gaping mouth here that's going to suck air in to the cool to help cool that uh v8 engine it's a 6.3 liter v8 if i'm not mistaken and it sits under here somewhere so i made the call earlier that one of the advantages of mid-engine is you can do what you want with the air well mercedes did it anyway so they have this big radiator here helping cool the car uh, but the engine sitting just behind that radiator so in here but still uh in front of the driver behind the front axle thus making it front engine so if we look around the car let's see what we have uh just the one strike right here um again channeling air up this is all to deflect air uh, get it going over the car properly try to get it to hit that rear wing uh, you can see the side exit whereas the m6 gt3 the exhaust exited right here uh, this one a little bit further back there you want to make sure that uh you know as you're getting into this car doing a driver stint that you uh, burn the hair off your legs as you're getting in so mercedes thought of that and they made sure the exhaust exits right here um, on a more serious note, uh, you can see this intake here. Again, I would fear that some of that hot air would get sucked in, but I think the general intent here is to pull air into this rear wheel well here to help cool those brakes. Uh, again, we seem to be seeing the evolution of the uh, brakes, tires, and rotors um, uh, from Race Studio because you can see the level of detail that goes into these. I mean, that is the best looking rotor they've produced so far of the three cars we've looked at. And um, yeah. Yeah, then there's no V on these wheels either. So another thing making me a liar, but you can see the brake calipers here. And, uh, you know, again, the level of detail on these tires, absolutely incredible. You can see 325, 705, 18s. Pretty cool. What is the letter rating? Interesting. Anyway, um, yeah, you can see just the incredible level of detail that has gone into these. And, um, yeah, the, the hot air able to exit these rear wheel wells here. Uh, what do the front wheel wells do? Ah, there we go. So the front wheel wells have these here, uh, which should help exhaust some of the heat that builds up with those front brakes. So looking, can we go into the rear of this car? Well, actually, let's look at the back first. Um, diffuser, big old wing, no surprise there. You know, comparatively simple back here. I wouldn't say there's a lot to talk about. Uh, you could technically pump, excuse me, not pump. You could technically pop this uh, rear trunk here. But let's see if we can go inside here. Have a quick look at what is behind. It looks like we have some sort of carbon fiber surface here. So no usable trunk. This is not wide open like we saw with the M6, but there is, you can see the tube uh, construction here, the steel tubes giving the car some extra rigidity. But let's see if we can look back into it. Yeah, there's nothing much to look at. So we just have uh, whatever this happens to be right here. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but uh, yeah, kind of blanked off. So let's go ahead and look at the driver's view. Fuel level low, no surprise there. Uh, we have a standard rear view mirror here. Let me F7 myself so I can move about. 
you guys are used to seeing this race logic timer by now. And again, this display showing my name, amount of fuel, etc., etc. As you can see, this stock right here, uh, very similar to what you'd see if you happen to own the real world AMG uh, car from Mercedes Benz. Uh, this wheel, quite simple. Um, you know, it's got a number of buttons on it, but a comparatively simple wheel. Hey, pop quiz, what is this? Any ideas? That is actually the drink bottle. I found that out. I was watching a video recently and found out what that was. But uh, as you're getting in, you can remove this, put your own in, and then you'll have fresh water or juice or soda or whatever you want in your drink bottle and that will feed up into the driver's helmet. Uh, center console here is big and it takes up a lot of space. Uh, you can see all the different uh, buttons here, the various buttons needed to start the car and manage its systems. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Nothing too outrageous here. This dash similar to what we saw with the Huracan. And then the driver's wheel again, just a comparatively simple thing. Kind of look at the back of that wheel. Again, the level of detail that goes into these cars is, is absolutely amazing. We see the quick release there. And then looking back toward the driver, uh, do we see IMB Racewear anywhere? No, it doesn't look like this is actually an IMB Racewear uh, suit. So what do we have in the passenger seat? Let's see, let's, looking, let's look first at the rear at the wheel well, foot well, that's what I mean to say, passenger foot well. Again, this is meant to be some sort of Bosch product, Motorsport ECU, as you can see there. What do we have here? Uh, D-Run, oh, data logger. Okay, so that is your data logger there. So the two ports there. So uh, pit crew could come along and snag, open this door, plug in, download all the data, get what they need to get. Most of it is transferred back to the pits, but not all. So you can uh, manually do a download. Uh, looks like we have some dead ending cables here, which is interesting. Not sure what those are for. This again, I would think would be your fire suppression system. Let's see if we can get a better angle on that. Uh, is this, yeah, some sort of homologation label. Uh, yeah, there we go. So yeah, this is more of the fire suppression system. And again, the tube frames here, uh, we see the RSS cams. We'll have a look at those views in a second. Uh, this is a position indicator here. As you can see, where does this tie back to? Presumably this goes up to some sort of radio repeater. Do we have anything on the roof? Probably back here, but anyway, uh, this is a position indicator here. Going outside to take a look. Too close there. You can see my name and my position currently running first, as I should be. You can see some of these uh, electrical cables here tying in. Uh, they are connected at this point, just staggering levels of detail <laughs> absolutely amazing and some of these hoses here not sure where so this one it's got a hmm i don't know if that's a crank to close that or yeah it must be to close it so it comes through the firewall here it looks like the driver could close that if they needed to where does it sneak down to underneath the driver looks like it feeds underneath perhaps helping keep the feet cool i'm not actually sure you can see the three pedal system here interestingly and then more cables sneaking through the fi firewall underneath the pedals which doesn't seem very safe we have the safety net here you can see it branded race sim studio one on either side of the driver and that should just about do it. I think I talked about the rear view mirror already. You can see all the way down to, whoops, tie wraps. They have tie wraps here. Amazing, amazing. You can see a bit of light poking through there. Always nice, and then the emergency hatch on the top. That light, always good. It's ever raining, gives the rain a chance to sneak in and tick off the driver. Perfect. So let's, uh, Go ahead and have a look at the pit options here. I already alluded to this one being slightly different. Theoretical top speed. This is the first one we see over 300 kilometers an hour. 
Now we have tire compounds. So we have a hard compound and a wet compound. That's pretty interesting. Uh, liters of fuel, 0 to 125 again. I'm not going to show you. Or oh, 120, actually. I was wrong. I thought they were all 125. Just 120 here in the AMG. Uh, engine map, high, balanced, and low. So that's going to determine, um, obviously, how fast the car can go for how long. Electronics, we've seen that. Rear wing adjustment, front and rear brake duct, front and rear brake duct adjustment. Uh, preload, force feedback adjustment. I don't think we saw that on the other cars. And then your standard suspension adjustments, dampers. This one, instead of going one, two, three, five, it goes one, two, three, four. What a concept. And then we have pit stop strategy, of course. So that is about it for the Mercer. But again, I would say that uh, the GTM class does not get much better than this. Phenomenal car. And um, I'm going to drive it later on and you'll probably hear the glee in my voice. I think this car is absolutely phenomenal. It's simple compared to the other cars, but it is just excellent. All right. So we got four more to go still. And so we go now from one front engine V8 uh, rear wheel drive car to another. This is the Lux V8 based on the Lexus RCF GT3. The car has a very interesting shape, as you can see, front engine. So it's got the big old hood, big old bonnet up front there. And then we go to the butt. But look at the rear end of this car. It sticks out proud of the rear lights. You don't see that too often. But uh, yeah, this one was adapted from the GT Super GT GT300 class. So there's some perhaps unique characteristics here adapted from that Super GT class. Not sure. You can see. See, I told you there was V's. This one's got double V's. Uh, one yellow up front and one red or orange at the back. I'm not too great with colors, so I won't be able to tell you. Um, you can see the interesting exhaust channel here. Again, front engine channeling all that hot air out the side here. So let's go ahead and kill that engine so you can actually hear me if that is something you want to do. And then we'll start our tour of the Lux V8. Uh, typical canards directing air. Looks like the shape of the mirror is also designed to direct air back toward that rear wing front engine. So we're trying to get all the help we can get on uh, adding weight to the rear. Uh, cool cutout here. You know, you want to talk about a big mouth. Um, when I, I talked about the Mercedes having a, a big mouth. This one has a giant mouth. Look at the size of this cutout. So presumably in here, uh, you got your radiator maybe up here. I think it would be more advantageous to take air from a little bit higher up, not just directly off that hot track. So it's probably a little bit higher up there. Um, cool profile on the front here. Got these extra lights here and these real aggressive cutouts for the uh, proper headlights. Uh, you can see down to the rivets, everything's been uh, nicely modeled here. Uh, let's take a look up from above, see what we can see on the hood of this car. We can. Maybe glance. Ah, yes, there we go. Okay, so intake ducts here, big intake ducts feeding that V8 engine, that 5.4 liter V8. So, yeah, it looks like it's taking air through a red, well, yeah, hard to say what's going on. But anyway, those, I believe, would be the intake ducts there feeding into a V8 engine uh, somewhere in this area. We won't be able to see it, but that's fine. Uh, looking down in here, a bit of carbon fiber there. I'm not sure what that's touching. Can we tell? We can't really tell what's going on, but uh, these ducts here, maybe I'm looking at the back of a red. I'm not sure what's going on there. Either way, air channeling through here and uh, doing what it needs to do, what air should do. As you can see with these wheel wells, we have these louvers here helping exhaust some of that heat. I would think by their shape, they would kind of pull the air out and to, to some degree anyway. Uh, we see we got gold calipers here. How fancy is that? It looks like similar rotors to what we saw on the Mercer, so nice touch there. Uh, the floor extending looks like you would expect the floor to kind of stop right here with this exhaust channel, uh, but it doesn't. The floor extends a little bit further. You can see the bolt there. And uh, yeah, just a fantastic level of detail here. I don't know exactly what the purpose of these guys would be. Maybe uh, just so it doesn't get too, too hot in here. Um, 
But yeah, then the dual exhaust, one on this side mirrored on the other side, uh, feeding that exhaust out. Thankfully, there's no giant intake here, so it's not as if uh, this hot air is going to get immediately pulled into these rear wheel wells. Uh, but either way, um, the it looks at first like you wouldn't be able to exhaust any heat from this rear wheel well. But if we swing, swing around back here, you can see that this one... Oh, look at how nicely that's modeled. So you can see air would just get pulled right through here. When the car is in motion, that air would come right through. My cursor would disappear behind this body panel and that air would just channel through. So nice way to cool the uh, rear brakes there. Swing, swinging around back, having a look at that uh, giant diffuser there. Um, big old wing here. Same thing we're used to seeing. Again, I love the headlights on this car. Absolutely gorgeous. So it looks like we have a rear view camera there as opposed to a rear view uh, mirror system. So another fake Lexus logo there. This would be a Lux logo. Let's have a look at the back of this car. It looks to be more similar. Wow, well, it's kind of halfway in between. Oh no, this is much more similar to the M6 GT3. As you can see, steel reinforced cage here, helping keep things rigid. We got some wires uh, probably serving the lights, I would guess. Can't really tell what it's all for, but either way, nicely detailed. A couple of cables kind of snaking their way through here, making their way through the back of the car. And then we look up front, couple of haphazard looking uh, strapping jobs here. I don't know what that would be for. That's interesting. Um, but yeah, you can see just the, you know, side panel cutouts and everything so well detailed. Let's take a look at the driver's view here. I will F7 myself. And then you see this Lexus wheel here, the uh, rotary dials here. Not sure what gear would be. That's a very interesting one. Um, but yeah. The standard buttons here, pit limiter, starter, uh, radio, etc., etc. So decent looking wheel, not my favorite looking wheel, but decent looking. And then we see this display here, similar to the M6 GT3, I believe. So a tachometer bar. And then uh, I, I'm guessing that's a low fuel indicator, possibly. Uh, but then we have, we zoom in, whoops, too much. We zoom in here, uh, fuel in liters, and then, uh, yeah, your four tires there, and then probably, yeah, traction control, ABS system, that kind of thing, current time, battery voltage, etc. We can look at our race logic timer here yet again, and then this display, uh, which is uh, featured in all RSS GTM cars. Just swing around here, have a look at this wheel. Big, massive paddle shifters. Interesting that uh, shows the uh, driver's grip there. Three fingers behind, one finger in front of that paddle. Pretty cool. But like, I mean, down to the bolts. That's, look at the bolts on the back of that thing. That's amazing. Wow. Uh, safety nets, as you would expect, left and right of the driver. Uh, let's look down in the footwell here. So again, oh, actual Bosch branded. Very interesting. So there's your ECU. Uh, what is this? Uh, laser. Is that shaking or am I losing my mind here? Oh, it's heat. Okay, I have uh, uh, heat shimmering <laughs> turned on. So I'm not sure what that is. Some sort of laser. I wonder what that could be. Uh, lots of mysteries on this Lux. Uh, this would be your fire suppression system again. Uh, more orange tubing. Looks like it's feeding in. Uh, let's see. Grid by Simlab. I believe when this car was released, they did a giveaway with Grid. So Grid got their name added in here. Uh, Race Logic, Bosch. Pretty cool. Let's see. Looks like we have one RSS cam here. Uh, this again, this is that plug-in port. We've got air channeling through here. Let's see what we can do for uh, RSS cams here. There's our RSS cam. Interesting. 
Let me just look. Is there two RSS cams? We kind of had a view from right about there. And then is there two over there? Scary eye in the corner of the screen there. Yeah, just the one RSS cam, but we have multiple views. Very interesting. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Big wiring harness down here. Looks like the emergency kill switch for the power here. And yeah, look at all that. Look at that level of detail. Absolutely amazing. Oh, I see one more thing I want to check out. What is this? Not sure what that would be. It looks like a radio. Could be a radio. I don't know. Not sure what all this does, but uh, yeah, just amazing levels of detail. Quickly looking at the pits here. 278. Oh, we have multiple gear sets here. Standard and long. The long gear affording you 20 more kilometers per hour. Uh, very interesting. Tires, uh, just no wets here. Just the dry hards, fuel. Let's see, capacity is 120. Electronics, no fuel maps. Traction control and ABS is it. Rear wing, very high by default. And then it looks like the rest is fairly standard. One, two, three, five again. And that is about it. Three more to go. So no, your eyes do not deceive you. And no, this is not a mistake. This is a different Lanzo. This is the Lanzo Evo 2. So in the real world, we went from the Huracan to the Huracan Evo, which was the Lanzo V10 I featured previously. And now we have the uh, Huracan Evo 2, which RSS calls their Lanzo Evo 2, or Lanzo V10 Evo 2, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, this is the second evolution. As, as you can see, it is quite uh, different uh, in, in one key aspect here. We've got the big snorkel and then the shark fin across the top here. So um, some interesting style changes. It's, most of it's the same. It did have a different homologation number, um, but generally it's quite similar to the Evo, but uh, certainly more of a drastic change going from Evo to Evo 2 than it was from standard to Evo. So same thing, uh, mid-engine, 5.2 liter V10. This is the standard engine. Lamborghini loves this engine. They put it in anything they can. It's been very successful for them. So if it ain't broke, as they say, why change it? Let's quickly take a tour. Let's kill the engine and then take a tour. So going in... I'm not going to say the thing where I say there's canards here channeling air over. You guys already know. Let's have a quick look at how low this Evo 2 sets. It is very, very tight to the ground. It is dangerously close to the ground. Whoops, too much. So am I. You can see just about scraping there. So having a look in the wheel wells here. They've abandoned the triangle configure, excuse me, the V configuration for a triangle configuration here uh, again same thing the scratches on the rotor amazing amazing and it looks like the same spec of tire here uh, calipers valve stem amazing and a bit of a sheen to these tires more so than i remember the other ones having so looking at the front of the car here absolutely stunning profile well not profile but absolutely stunning uh, alignment of this car it looks aggressive it looks like it's going to tear up the track and quite frankly it does the car is phenomenal i can't wait to drive this thing again all these sharp angles this is not by accident this car is designed to intimidate and it does just that it is a beautiful machine and uh yeah it is not here to play around uh so you can see the front releases here i suspect if we look down in this hole we should see that radiator as we do big fan there helping pull air in and these louvers helping exhaust heat from the front wheel wells you guys know the deal by now and then if we look behind these wheel wells i don't believe this was present on the evo but i could be wrong uh even more room for there's basically nothing on the back here so that air from the wheel wells can just freely exhaust uh 
out, out of that wheel well to help keep those uh, brakes cool. Uh, similarly, for the rear, not sure if we can actually see through, might not be able to get in that close, but you can see a nice intake port for, can we see through? No, not quite. But it looks like, looks to be a nice intake port. Uh, I'm guessing one of these probably routes to the engine uh, to help supplement that air intake. But uh, certainly part of this, I believe, would be intended to help cool these rear wheel uh, wheel wells wheel wells. And then uh, this other outboard piece here uh, that actually sits proud of the car, I believe. It is one of the wider pieces on the car. Yeah, it looks like there's sort of a general taper to the car. So this would be one of the widest pieces other than the side view mirror. So very interesting, but just incredible, stunning levels of detail here. Uh, you can see they've even modeled. This is two pieces and they bothered, bothered modeling that. So absolutely amazing rear uh, toe strap here. A bit scratched up from this thing having a terrible time on track and having to be towed everywhere backwards. I'm not sure why it's uh, so torn up, but an interesting level of detail there. Some sort of heat shielding here. Um, you got that big hot exhaust there. Uh, and same thing here, we have heat shielding to help protect that carbon fiber. And then we're kind of getting glimpse here. I believe that is the rear facing camera. This is the rain light. Gorgeous, gorgeous. And again, in keeping with everything I've said thus far, huge old wing, the nice simple diffuser. And this view kind of gives you an idea of how wide those rear tires are. All right, can we see anything of this engine? Probably not, but it is mid-mounted. It is housed in there somewhere. Oh, we can see a tiny bit of it. Gotta be careful here, but that looks like the air cleaner. Uh, or no. Must be the air cleaner, right? Because the exhaust is lower. So anyway, hard to tell what the components are from this limited view. But uh, anyway, that is where your V10 engine is. Let's have a look from the driver's view. So similar, the sort of patented dash screen here. We immediately associate this with the view of a Lamborghini Huracan GT3. Beautiful looking wheel. Look at that color. Look at how well they've nailed the color there. And then looking toward the center console, right? Sneak over just ever so slightly. There we go. USB port there. What kind of USB is that? That's strange. Um, but yeah, these things that you would fire up in order to uh, get the car running, uh, fuel pump, etc., engine map, brake bias adjustment, that kind of thing. So very cool. Not functional in this car but cool just the same see the little vibrating strap over there and there should be another vibrating strap over here indeed there is your race logic timer over here and then a little box here we can see the uh the quick release there same thing actually the last one, we had three fingers behind the paddles. This one, we've got all four behind. So interesting that Racing Studio has gone with different finger configurations uh, by car. I like that. Coming over here, I see RSS cams. That gets me excited. This one, back to the Roche. We're not with Bosch anymore. Uh, this is a similar uh, passenger well to uh, what we had, of course, in the Evo. Fire suppression system, similar boxes here. That looks like your engine, whoops. So your engine cut or fire, excuse me, fire suppression system. And then uh, this um, reservoir here. And then let's check our RSS cams. One and two, very cool. And then this other one here, which is not represented with its own RSS cam, I don't think. Let's fly, look back. Oh, so it is. Look at that. One, two, three. Very cool. And then a couple extra dials here. A couple of wires. Nope, they don't leave. I thought they might have gone through the firewall, but they do not. Foot cam here. We can see the backs of the pedals which are interestingly, either my angle is weird or they are red. Anyway, it doesn't matter. 
you can kind of see what's going on there. Uh, looking upward toward the driver here. No water bottle there or anything. All right, I think this pretty much covers it because we had a good look at this with the Evo. But again, you see the tie wraps up there keeping everything in place. You have your position indicator up here. Let's quickly go out, look at the position indicator. Running in first place is Sim Racing 604. That's right. And then a patent here on the Race Logic timer. Very cool. All right, so let's go take a look at the pit configuration. I believe we do have wet. Actually, first we have standard and long gears. Uh, we do have a wet compound with this Evo 2. We also have, let's see, what is the fuel capacity? 120 again. And then we have engine map, low, balanced, and high. Electronics, as you would expect. Aero, as you would expect. Uh, brake duct adjustment. This is uh, not a common thing to all of the GTM cars, but this one has it. And then the suspension adjustments that you would expect. This one has a visual adjustment. So door vent. What is that? What is that? What is that? Let's go see if we can find it. Door vent. Oh, there we go. How cool is that? How much air do you want, sir? All the air. And none of the air. Very cool. All right. I love this thing. I equally can't wait to drive it. Same with the Mercer. So let's uh, get through the last two and then we'll start to drive. So our second to last car is this beautiful Akiro. This is the Akiro Evo 2. Uh, this one's based on the Honda NSX Evo 22. Now, I don't remember 21 iterations between the Honda NSX Evo and the Evo 22, but just the same, we have the Evo 22. So, uh, you can see this Acura looks absolutely stunning. I love the looks of this car. It's got a mid-mounted V6 engine behind the driver, and so it's, yeah, kind of an interesting engine take. You don't see a lot of six-cylinder engines, uh, but this is the way Honda decided to go. I believe it's a Cosworth engine. I could be wrong about that, but um, either way, uh, it's a V6 engine, twin turbo, and uh, helps compete in the GT3 class. So let's quickly look around the car. So starting from the front here, gorgeous profile. What a great looking car. Uh, you can see those very interesting looking headlights there. And then that toe strap down low, making those marshals work for it. A little bit of wood trim there. Is that accurate to real life? I've never noticed that before, but uh, very cool detail there by Race Sim Studio. Looking in at these Brando brakes. It's not Brembo, of course, it's Brando. And then we look at the rotors there, scratched, looking beautiful. Nice shiny tires untouched so far by the track. And then we zoom overhead. You can see the fan in there doing its thing on the radiator cooling that air and uh, a couple of emergency pulls there we can kill the power to the car if need be well we can't but in real life you could and then looking at this carbon fiber finished side view mirror here which again could hardly cut a thinner profile whoops uh more to be said about the profile of the mirror than my navigating in this game. You can see the way the light reflects off the windows, gorgeous. Uh, but yeah, you can see how efficiently that would cut through the air. And then looking at the wheel wells, because I have some strange obsession with wheel wells and how they vent. Uh, these vents look closed, interesting. Oh no, they're open. Uh, so yeah, you can uh, exhaust your hot brake air out these louvers here. And then it looks like we also have a cutaway behind the wheel well. There you go, to help channel some of that uh, hot air out of there. Uh, same thing for the rear. Uh, my suspicion is this is, would be a rad. I could be wrong about that, but uh, either way, some of that air would flow through. It looks not dissimilar to the uh, to the Lanzo Evo 2. But uh, yeah, some of that air would go through here and help cool. We also have louvers up here to help keep those rear brakes cool. And then, uh, yeah, some of that would go through to the engine. Again, twin turbo V6, let's cut around back here. My goodness, I never noticed how gorgeous this car was, but it truly is gorgeous. 
Uh, whoops, I am sorry, I've had the engine running this whole time. Is it normally making that sound? Anyway, you can see the exhaust coming out here, just above the diffusers. You can see some linkage in there. Uh, big rear wing. Let's see if we can sneak a picture, sneak a look at that V6 engine. What happens if we go through? Uh, a little bit. Oh, there we go. See the air intake. Where does that come from? Where does that come from? Hard to tell exactly where it comes from. You can see the filler there. Filler it should be a filler on the other side that's blanked off. No, they're both. They both look like they're active. Interestingly, uh, but yeah, you can kind of see through this grill down into that mid-mounted V6. Very cool. Up on top of the car, emergency escape hatch here, and then a bunch of radio and comms up here. Helping the driver communicate back. I always forget to do this, so we'll come around here and have a look. Is there a position indicator? Uh, of course not. The one time I remember to look for the position indicator, it is not there. You can see these little cutaways helping uh, with intake. This door probably would not open under normal circumstances, so you can have a hose like that directing air. I'm guessing into the cockpit. Let's have a quick look here. Where does that hose go? Up above, oh, straight into the driver's helmet. Breathing is always a good thing when you're driving. Underrated aspect of driving is the ability to breathe. Looking down here at this Acura wheel, uh, it's big, it's got basically everything you could want, traction control and ABS on dials here. Uh, Two-stage traction control, which is not modeled here in Assetto Corsa, to my knowledge. Uh, you can scroll through different pages of your screen here. This screen uh, looks quite different than the other ones we have in this car. Um, I would guess tachometer there. And then these indicator lights here telling you pit limiter, and I'm guessing one of those is low fuel as well. Uh, we have safety straps to the left and right, vibrating as they do. Typical race logic timer here. And then uh, that's an interesting door handle. I kind of expect more of a door handle. It looks like you could snap that thing off in the middle of a race. Uh, but looking slightly over here, big center console, lots going on here, all trimmed in carbon fiber. This thing just could not have more carbon fiber. Um, but a nice looking center console in the air there, uh, helping cool the interior. So in addition to breathing, the driver also gets to not uh, catch fire from heat. That's a bad term, but you know what I mean. You can see the firewall there cut out, nothing sneaking through it. This might go through. There we see the driver's radio set to channel one. Too close, too close. But anyway, you guys get the point, channel one. Fire suppression. Little fan there, helping cool this box. That could be a data collection box or something like that. And then we have various hoses and wires connected uh, throughout this cockpit. Looking behind the driver, looks like there's some sort of removable panel there. Not sure what, that could be access to something in the engine bay. Uh, driver's seat belt there, it's a five point harness. so. Uh, connection would be made right above the or right in front of the driver's belly button effectively and that should be about it rear view camera i didn't see the camera at the back interestingly let's go take another look here where is that camera located there is that camera located and what else we got to look at here nothing much else just uh, fantastically well detailed, as you would imagine. This is the second most recent, and it really feels like they're going for broke on the level of detail. Uh, there's an RSS cam. How many other RSS cams do we have? One, just the two. Let's check them out. One, two, three. Hmm, they did not model the third camera, I don't think. Let's see here. One, yeah, that's it. 
I thought that hose was connected to the driver's helmet. It is from this angle, but doesn't quite touch. Whatever it is, I'm guessing that's because the driver's head has to turn a bit. But you can see the tie-in points here for the driver's safety harness. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> Just kind of chuckling to myself at the level of detail. It's phenomenal. Wow. Wow. Just gorgeous. And same thing over here on this door. The door entirely stripped of any cosmetics, but still kept this little plastic handle. Uh, yeah, very interesting. All right. Um, let's see here. Quick look at the pit configuration. Uh, so same thing. We have a standard and a long gear ratio, 307 kilometers an hour, theoretical top speed. Uh, dry tire and a wet tire fuel capacity, 120. Uh, three engine map settings, ABS interaction control, everything you'd really expect. Same thing, adjustable, uh, excuse me, front and rear brake ducts, force feedback linear, the one, two, three, four. Uh, it's something I'm missing. Some of them say one, two, three, five. Some of them say one, two, three, four. So very interesting here. All right. That's good enough. Let's go on to the last car. All right. So we may have saved the best for last here. This is the Aero V10. And um, this is the second evolution of the Audi R8 LMS. So uh, it's the, known as the Evo 2. We do not have the Evo, I don't think, in Assetto Corsa from any major mod studio. I could be wrong about that. Um, you can tell the body style is very different, but underneath the uh, beautiful exterior you see, uh, this is very similar to the Evo 2 we have uh, for the Lamborghini. Very, very similar, in fact. Uh, when I posted my first preview video of this car, a lot of people said, or some people said, you know, is that the same sound as the Lanzo? And in a sense it is. It's the 5.2 liter V10 uh, mounted midship here um, and just a, a, a ton in common with between the two cars. So uh, some cosmetic differences, of course, but functionally they're very, very similar. Okay, this time I'm actually going to remember to kill the engine. And now we can begin our fly around. So you can see not as striking at the, oh, that's a cool angle, man. I like that. Excuse me, I'm just gonna F12 that. There we go. I will come back to that. Um, as you can see here, we got these strakes and our canards, whatever you want to call them. And these ones have a little lip, as you can see on the end. Not all of the canards we've looked at today have this. It's just more technology to help channel air. And uh, speaking of air, I'm going to deviate from my usual pattern here and swing around back of the car. Look at how this rear wing is held up. It's like a gooseneck, but from the back. So it goes all the way around the wing and back up to support it. I find that very interesting. Uh, but anyway, resuming the tour up front here, uh, we have the uh, standard lights, and I believe we also have uh, endurance lights on this thing. So uh, these extra lights should come on by an extra button. You can see there's a little tab here. I suspect you pull on that uh, and we are able to unlock the uh, front bonnet here. A couple of little NACA ducts there, possibly channeling air into the cockpit for the driver. And this again, I suspect if we look at this from the right angle, uh, there you go. The fan is not turning, but we should be able to, uh, uh, yeah, when we have the engine running, it should spin, I believe. And that is your big radiator. Let's just test this real quick. There we go. So as soon as you fire up that engine, uh, that fan kicks in as well. So very cool. Uh, big louvers here, unsurprisingly, standard tech, uh, channeling air or helping channel air out of those hot wheel wells. You see these louvers up here, that'll help exhaust. Uh, looking down here, we also have louvers back here, which again, just getting that air moving. The floor extending a little bit beyond the door here. You can see this looks an awful lot like a light strip. Remember that for later. And then we have something going on back here. It looks like this is an air intake. This NACA duct is probably what links into this uh, rear wheel well. So not a ton of air going in there, uh, but uh, we have a direct output here as well. 
there it is. So we can get that heat off of those rear brakes. That is pretty cool. Uh, I mentioned about the rear wing already. You can see the different angles it can be set to. Let's see, do we have a visual adjustment here? We do not, but let's see what happens if we adjust this rear wing. Does it change physically? Doesn't look like it, no. Okay, anyway, but you can see how you would set the uh, angle of the, uh, of the rear wing there. We have the screaming V10 engine exhaust here. Look at that level of detail. We have a rain light here as well. That can be selected uh, through one of your extra buttons in Assetto Corsa. And then the diffuser, can't really see here. It's a bit dark here. I chose the wrong time of day, but you can kind of see the shape of that rear diffuser. Comparatively simple, uh, making up for the overly complex rear wing perhaps, uh, but a nice profile on this Audi. Again, very similar in configuration uh, to the Lanzo Evo 2. And then if we fly up, we can see more of this engine than we have seen of any of the other cars. Look at that. Look at that. I'm trying to get it to where there's not too much reflection, but having a tough time here. But you can see the two banks here on this V10. You can see, uh, it looks like a steering wheel. Power steering fluid, maybe? Uh, there's the oil filler cap. Very cool. Can we get in under this? Yeah, but it kind of goes sideways after that. But anyway, you can see down into the engine bay, which I find really, really cool. Uh, I forgot to check, is there a camera out back here? Or are we using a mirror? Do you see a camera? I am not seeing a camera. Is that the toe strap there? Maybe. All right, let's go look. Oh, okay, it is a rear view mirror. There's not much for view, but it should be just enough for these professionals uh, to be able to see who's coming up on them. So uh, this here, by the way, there's a night mode. and I'll get into that at some point. I'll try and remember to showcase that, but I find it very cool. But this screen actually has a night mode, which is really cool. So it becomes a little bit easier to see. It's not a bright, bright light in front of you. Uh, it becomes darker and easier on the eyes. So as you can see, uh, interestingly, the side view mirror supports here are on the outside. You don't see that too often, but it's supported from the outside looking down at this don't call me an Audi steering wheel and look at that wheel. Whew. Gorgeous. You can see how the uh, the buttons stand proud of the wheel. They're not just uh, like these ones are basically on the wheel. This, these ones are angled out toward the driver's thumb. What a cool feature. Um, trying to see if you can see the screw. Yes, you can see the bolt actually that goes down in there. Um, I was just about to say, you know, standard. Oops, there we go. Standard quick release here. But there's nothing standard about it. <laughs> that thing is gorgeous. The level of detail they've gone to here, phenomenal. Absolutely stunning. Uh, the driver, he's locked in, man. He ain't listening to me. He's ready to go. Put me in, coach. All right, what do we have up here? It looks like we've done away with the RSS cams and got this cam, interestingly. It's kind of looking out toward, let's see if we can find that camera angle. Yeah, I guess that's it there. Uh, interesting that the RSS cam is gone. Hmm. Is there another RSS cam? And then this one is better than an RSS cam. They have stepped up. As you can see in the passenger well here, or what would be a passenger well, we've got a few products here, fire suppression system, uh, Bosch Motorsport something with a barcode. Uh, this, whoops, I believe would be your suppression. Yep, so you can turn your suppression system on from there. You can see they've even bothered. This is Race Sim Studio in a nutshell. They've bothered with the warning label here. I mean, they could just mail this in. They could just put your standard, you know, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog text. But no, they put a real warning there. Uh, then we see some more control boxes here. Uh, terminal strips there. What is this? The Handler Electronic Industries something or other. Fire suppression bottle. What do we have here? Bosch ECU. Reserve tank. So it is similar, as I mentioned earlier, to the uh, to the Evo. The excuse me, the Lance. 
not the Lancer, the Lanzo. Um, yeah, with its reservoir here. I uh, can't tell. Ooh, look at this. Race Logic control box. Oh, SD card slot. How's that for detail, man? That's amazing. And then we look down here. It looks like some sort of USB stick plugged in here. Um, can't tell exactly what that is, but it's got a network port. It's got Wi-Fi and then USB. So just <laughs> silly levels of detail here. And you can see these connections on the electrical systems here. Uh, behind the driver, it looks like a continuation, another bottle here uh, for su fire suppression. What else do we got? Door strap there, door handle there. That one looks a bit more beefy than the one we saw <laughs> on the Honda. Um, but yeah, it just continues on and on. I mean, you could look at the details on this car all day. I do find it interesting that they went away from the RSS cam. Where does that tie back to? Let's see, where does that camera tie back to? Ah, into the race logic. Okay. So I'm guessing it's all stored in there so you can map video to your RS, excuse me, to your race logic data. Pretty amazing. And then we look at the center console here. I missed looking at it earlier, but you can see it would be an Audi logo there, racing studio simulation racing, and just more uh, incredible levels of detail there. So very, very cool. I think the highlight of this for me though is this wheel. I find it absolutely gorgeous. What a wheel. What a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of uh, sim machinery. And then we have a stamp of RSS on these gloves. Yes, they stamp their gloves. How's that? A little bit of stubble there. All right, so that is it in a nutshell. One last thing to check here, and then we will uh, start. Well, first of all, I want to look at some of the uh, custom shaders patch details that they've included with the car, and then we'll start to talk, uh, excuse me, and then we'll start to drive the cars. Yes, I'll get there eventually. Uh, so gearing, no long and short, just standard, almost 300 kilometers an hour possible in this car. Uh, hard and wet. Dry and wet, I should say. Fuel capacity, 120, yep. Uh, low balance high, as you would expect. Standard tuning, front and rear brake duct tuning. Uh, let's see here, suspension, and then we saw there was no visual tuning. So that is it. That's been a look at all of the seven GTM cars we have thus far. Um, but some of them, including this Arrow, and I will probably use this as the example, um, have some pretty cool other features that I want to take a look at. So next, we'll jump out on track and uh, take a look at some of the custom shaders patch features. And then we will actually get to driving these things. So we're going a bit out of order here, but I am going to show you how to get the cars installed. So once you have purchased the cars from the Race Sim Studio website, uh, you will download it. You will have a zip file. And in the case of this Arrow version one, you have three folders and one file. This PDF will tell you more about the cars. You can read that at your own time. I recommend you do. Uh, but these three uh, folders here are what's important. That's what's going to install the car in the game. Now, a lot of people like to drag and drop zip files into uh, Content Manager and let Content Manager do the install. Do not do this. I recommend that you do it manually. And uh, the way we're going to do that is just make sure we have these three folders selected. We will also have the Aceto Corsa installation folder uh, open. So this is within Steam Library, Steam Apps, Comment, and then a set of course, and you'll see a list of folders here, including content, crash logs, extension, etc. And then you just simply, again, select these three folders, drag and drop to your Aceto Corsa folder. In my case, I've already done this, so I don't need to worry about that. Uh, but do that for any GTM cars you buy. Now, there is one additional step. So if we go into content, we go into cars, we scroll all the way down through my oversized list of cars that I own. Uh, we see the uh, arrow. This is the one I just installed. Let's double click that. Let me maximize so you guys can see that better. And we have two batch files, a CSP physics and a standard physics. 
if you are running Content Manager and Custom Shaders Patch, double click this, or excuse me, double click this, the CSP Physics Batch file, and that is going to sort of upgrade the car to the CSP Physics. If you're running standard vanilla Assetto Corsa, just double click this standard physics. Depending on the car, depending on the version, either the standard or the CSP is going to be enabled. So make sure you have the correct version installed. So again, for the standard physics, that is people running vanilla AC. If you happen to be running Content Manager and Custom Shaders Patch, double click the CSP Physics Batch file. I'm going to do that right now. It should already be installed. It's going to flag. I'm going to run it anyway. And then it says it's installed, press any key, and you're good to go. And the same thing would apply to the standard physics. So that's how you get your cars installed. It may seem complex, but trust me, it will pay off. Now, what does the CSP physics do? Let's take a quick look. So if we go back into content manager and if we go to settings, stalling, stalling, there we go. A set of course uh, controls under the patch uh, heading here, uh, we have extra option A, B, C, and D plus high and low beams. As you can see, I have them mapped uh, to my wheel. So I've got A, B, C, and D and a high and low beam um, uh, button all mapped. And that's gonna allow me to do various things with the cars. So I'm gonna take the arrow out onto the track and I will show you what each of these extra options do. Now, it is not the same for all cars, so I'm gonna use the arrow, it's the latest. I believe it takes advantage of all four of those buttons plus high and low beams. So let's get out on track and let's see what that does. Okay. So let's see if any of this worked. So if we pull back to the rear of the car and I press extra option A, indeed we have our rain light. We can turn that on and off. Let's go back. And then if we do extra option B, I haven't had any luck for some reason in the arrow, the extra option B is not working. His visor should be dropping, but I'll go to a different car and show you in a little bit. Um, let's go back. Uh, we can do extra option C, which should be a little fist pump, a little celebration there. Yes, we did it. Uh, that's if you win a race, so I can go ahead and unmap that. If we swing around front of the car here, as you can see, we have no lights right now, but I'll pull back a little bit. So, whoo that is gorgeous. All right, um, so, if we, I can turn my headlights on, not a big deal, um, but I can also turn high beams on and off. As you can see, those are standard lights. Those are my bright lights, standard bright. In addition to my bright, I also have my endurance lights. So you'll notice not only do we have uh, these lights here, but I believe it's going to toggle or are these linked? Remember I talked about that light strip before? You can see that comes on. And there's even different, depending on the car, you can even select different LED light strip patterns uh, manually outside of the game, which is really awesome. Let's see, is that linked to my, okay, that's linked to my headlights, I gotcha. Okay, so as soon as headlights go on, all these LED strips, and we can get another look here. Uh, there's LED strips back here, across the back windshield, across the front windshield. And again, that appears to be linked to my headlights. So very cool. So what does that look like from inside the car? Uh, let's go ahead and turn all my lights off. So this is standard headlights. You can see a little bit reflecting off the wall there. If I go to high beams, you can see it gets a lot brighter. And then again, if I go and hit my endurance lights, it gets very bright so you can see that dramatic effect uh, that the different lights have now i mentioned earlier uh that there is a night mode of the screen um, i think i can fake this let's see let me go to photo mode here and i think if i creep back so this is in uh day mode right now or is this night mode let me just creep back the time okay so that's in day mode there Okay, so that's day mode. And then if we get past a certain time, which looks to be uh, somewhere around 8.15 local time, um, yeah, it goes to night mode. So that's pretty cool. So it's not gonna blind you. How cool is that? 
so yeah, just some of the features, but there's also additional features. So um, nothing I can really show you from inside the cockpit. Um, so let me go ahead and just sort of talk you through some of the other features that the CSP version enables. So just before I walk you through the features, let's have a quick look here at uh, extra option B. So this time I'm on board the Lanzo and uh, extra option B lowers and raises the visor. <laughs> Kind of a cool feature, um, but yeah, uh, for some reason I can't get it to work in the Arrow, uh, but that's how it works here in the Lanzo Evo 2. Okay, so in addition to the features I just showed you from the uh, custom shaders patch, there's also just sort of general physics updates for these cars that have been applied thanks to CSP. So for example, the tires, there's a improved heating model within the tires and they also have applied more accurate stiffness to the tires. And even for collision detection, there is ray tracing applied. So kind of cool tire features that are applied to all of these GTM cars. They've also, in terms of suspension, been able to achieve non-linear bump stops and more accurate suspension geometry. The arrow of the cars, there is more accurate arrow maps for the cars. The roll and yaw effects are now simulated, which I think is cool because, for example, the Lanzo Evo 2 uh, does have that shark fin. So when you get into roll and yaw effects, that shark fin will come into play. The Seto Corsa by default did not have engine maps, if you can believe it, but thanks to the custom shaders patch, there's now different engine map options. So most of these GTM cars do have a low balanced and a high output engine map. Racing Studio has also been able to more accurately program fuel consumption for these cars. And then in terms of braking as well, the brake heating model and the introduction of brake duct systems has also been applied to the cars. So or many of the cars anyway. So very cool that they've been able to take advantage all of, that, of all that and bring us a more accurate driving experience. And I think that really shows. So at long last, it is finally time to drive some GTM cars. Okay, so we are finally driving. We're here at Monza in the Bayer. Um, we have traction control. So I have a button mapped to my wheel. Same thing for ABS. We can adjust that on the fly. And we also have brake bias adjustments. So I'll keep everything default for the time being, but then maybe as my confidence grows, as we uh, get further along, get everything up to temperature, my confidence increases. Maybe we can pull out a bit more. So the first thing you notice about the bear is it feels big and heavy. Now this car, of course, had a reputation and it was largely ascribed to the M8 size, but the M6 kind of has some uh, things in common visually with its M8 GTE uh, cousin. So the M6 is thought of as a big car. It's not actually that big. It's um, like over a foot longer than some of the cars on this list. But uh, in comparison, for example, to the Lux, it's not actually that big. So just something to think about. So again, it, it, it feels that way, but I think some of that is just mental from the appearance of the car. But uh, overall, it's you know not that much bigger than some of the other cars in the list. And uh, of course, no heavier, because these are homologated to, uh, what is it? Uh, 1300 to 1400 kilograms, if I'm not mistaken. So, the Bayer gets a bad reputation for being big and brutish, but uh, in terms of its physical size, it's really not. But it does drive that way. I will say it feels kind of heavy, and that actually works to its advantage. This, if you're familiar at all with the uh, Bentley from ACC, it has very, very similar driving characteristics. It feels big and heavy, and it drives that way. It feels planted. It feels like that front end. Um, you know, the, the the front tires can really lock in and get the necessary grip. So. Yeah, it's uh, got that going for it, especially if you're new to GT3 or you're not that confident at GT3 racing. This is a phenomenal car to start with. It's a good confidence builder. I would say the same thing about the Lux, actually. They're both very uh, good at uh, sort of building up your confidence with GT3 or GTM in this case. So we are done the first lap here. Uh, usually takes two to three laps for the tires to really come into their own. So I'm not gonna push, I'll just 
try for something kind of sub two minutes, hopefully in the, uh, you know, minute 55 range. Just as things kind of come up to temp. And also we have a full tank of fuel and a default setup. So I'm not expecting miracles here. There will be no sub 150 laps, let's say that. But interestingly, when you talk about lap time, the bear tends to be one of the more uh, forgiving cars when it comes to lap time. I find I can turn uh, surprisingly fast laps here. It feels, I uh, keep using the word heavy, but it feels brutish on the track. Uh, feels boxy but at the same time I can turn some pretty good laps because you're so confident through the corners that you feel you can push a little bit more each time and uh, you know really start to bring those lap lap times down can't bring laptops down So, so far so good. Again, feeling confident. Things are coming up to temperature uh, with the CSP physics. Again, two to three laps for things to really uh, start to take effect. I'm uh, just thinking to myself now, did I enable the CSP physics in this car? Hopefully I did. Whatever the case, um, something you'll notice on the center of your screen there, that uh, GPS or sat nav you might know it as, is functional. You see it with the accurate track time there in the top right hand corner and then uh, it knows the turns that are coming up as well. Now that's not <laughs> an extremely handy feature in circuit racing of course. You should know what turns are coming up as well uh, but it's just interesting to uh, to see it functional there and that works uh, in all kind of scenarios. All right I'm gonna dial back the traction control by two clicks and see if that gives us a little bit more speed out of the corners. Um, just Bring this heavy car to a slow into turn one. Uh, keep the ABS up for the time being. So still very confident on the exit there. Let's go one click down on ABS, see if that helps anything. So far slightly up on my previous best, though not much. And yeah, that big old twin turbo V8. Very interesting timbre inside the car. Is it my favorite sounding of the GTM cars? Absolutely not. In fact, it might be my least favorite, but uh, very distinct. And I think they've done, uh, Racing Studio, that is, has done a great job capturing that. So, yeah, you could start to, you know, dial down your electronic assists and start to bring your lap times down. Why do I keep wanting to say laptops? But, uh, yeah, that's where your lap time is going to come from is getting more confident with the car and start to bring those assists down so uh, you know you can get faster exits out of the corner, etc, etc. And uh, yeah, good things will come. So I'm still a bit too early on my braking there. I'll start to uh, push those distances forward a little bit. Let's go one more down. Minimal level of ABS here. See if that does anything. I'll go one down on traction control as well. Still at level five, so it's not like I have no traction control. I still have quite a lot on board. Will that make a difference? We will see. Over a second up on my previous best. Looks like we're gonna just dip into the 151s here. 151980. And yeah, car feels very confident, very easy to drive. ABS just doing enough there. Keep me under control. Traction control doing more than its fair share. I'm gonna go down again. Let's go with level four here, see if that can make a difference. Looks like I am gaining time. A bit faster on that last corner. Right around the bridge is where I'm gonna break this time. Still too early. There's a lot of distance there where I could uh, ease up on the brakes. But yeah, I'm carrying a heavy fuel load and just the stock setup here at Monza, and I'm in the 151s. And for an average driver like me, that is a decent lap time. So it just goes to show you that, uh, you know, the car doesn't have to feel the most spry to be the fastest. I expect uh, Race Sim Studio has done a good job with their BOP. And so this one may just hold the advantage here at Monza. I'm going to test across all different tracks, so I won't have a head-to-head -head comparison in this video. It's still a good uh, reassuring 
uh, lap time here from the Bayer. And we'll go once more around after this. See if we can find some correct braking distances. That was pretty good that time coming into uh, Parabolica. We might be able to get below 151. We'll see. Depends what I can do uh, through the middle sector of the track. If I can get a good launch, might be able to drop the overall lap time. A little lock there. Much faster out of the chicane that time. Wasn't a great line through the chicane, but I uh, got a decent jump and I'm up two tenths. So we're inching ever closer to that forecasted lap time sub 151. A lot closer on the braking distance that time. And that earned us two tenths. Went off into the gravel there, so we gave some of that back. Make sure I can hold a safe line around here. And might all come down to this. Need to get a good launch here. And did a decent job. Holding steady at four tenths up on my previous best. Gotta make sure we can control it through the Ascari chicane here. Whoa, too much, too much. That was a horrendous chicane. We cannot end on that. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking breaking that late, but uh, threw my whole chicane off. So we're actually a down on Delta. But the car is nicely warmed up, so I can start to push here. Onboard systems feel just about right for my driving skill. One fifty one four three five. Certainly not my worst lap, certainly not my best. Decent line through there that time. Back to a point two second positive delta or to the good I should say little lock nothing serious kept it within the lines that time there we go up five and a half tenths this time. And let's see if I can get through the Ascari chicane cleanly this time. Or is it going to be another ugly uh, chicane for me? That's better. Still slower on the exit. But I should still be up on my time. Hopefully I can beat that 151. Bit of wheel slip there. Nothing too bad. Decent launch onto the front straight here. And that should do it. Yeah, 150.776. I think I will take it. So that is the bear. Front engine, rear wheel drive. It's honestly a safe, uh, safe bet. If you're just getting used to GT3, um, this would be a good place to start. It's not my favorite car. It's not the most like exciting car to drive, but it certainly gets the job done. And again, it's deceptively fast. Um, once you sort of uh, get the hang of it and things come up to temperature, it's a deceptively fast GT3 car. So I think a lot of people are going to like it. All right, let's keep this going. All right, so here in the pits with the Lanzo V10, and same thing we saw in the last video. So we have adjustable traction control and cockpit adjustable um, ABS. 
So we'll keep those pretty high for now. We also have brake balance. Uh, as you can see, it's a different percentage. The uh, front engine rear wheel drive bare was 67% uh, by default. This one's 62% to the front. So this is the car that kind of made me fall in love with the GTMs and made me realize that Race Sim Studio is really on to something. You hear that roar of that V10 and there's just no <laughs> mistaking that they nailed the sound. But conversely, uh, or not conversely actually, but uh, also to go with that excellent sound is a wonderful driving experience. You know, mid-engine rear wheel drive. So this car is going to feel lighter. It's gonna feel more spry. It's gonna get a little bit looser on corner exit. Um, it, it, you know, if you're pushing it too hard, just the, um, the, the physics of the car are a lot less straightforward than they are with the, uh, with the bear. And yeah, that's actually what gives it its charm. It handles these, you know, mid-speed quarters beautifully. It's a tremendous machine. And it's not even the, uh, the final iteration. This is the Evo. We still have the Evo 2 still to come. So here at Valle Lunga, it's an interesting test track, I will admit. Not what we immediately associate with GT3 racing necessarily, but uh, I love this track just the same. Good test track. This corner here is a bit slow for these cars. Kind of gets very, very low in the revs, but uh, yeah, other than that, it's a great, great track. And this corner here can give you trouble if you're not careful. So we're running about 25 degrees on all four tires. We want to get that up in the 27, 28 range. Whoa, there we go. Woof, there we go, damaging my Lanzo. Told you, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit on edge compared to the Bayer. Through this high speed section here, even with tires not fully up to temp, still handled that just fine. And not pushing, pushing yet, but pushing hard enough that we can start to build those final few degrees of, uh, of temperature. Sorry, I, was, I said degrees, you know what I mean. PSI. I do have the lovely dashboard open in front of me if you're wondering why I keep looking down. So I got both the uh, surface temp and the uh, tire pressure in front of me so I can keep an eye on things and see exactly when I am fully up to temperature here in this Lanzo V10. Just the tiniest little bit of counter steer there needed to get this car safely around the corner. All four tires, nah, well, except for front right. Front right is still showing cold, so hopefully that won't come into play too much, but uh, we would definitely need to uh, get a setup going here in order to extract some serious lap times out of this car. Right now I'm just going for safe and moderately fast. So we've done two full laps here and things still not fully up to temp, so I think I'm just gonna have to go. I think I'm just gonna have to work with uh, slightly under pressured, slightly under temperature tires. Should be fine though, I think. Again, through this fast section here, the Lanzo handles it beautifully. You can feel the car kind of loading up. And yeah, this is going to be a night and day experience if you're coming straight from the bear to this, which a lot of us did when this first came out because it came out uh, for free for those who already had the bear. And uh, yeah, so a lot of us went from the bear directly to this, and what a difference. <laughs> the handling is just completely different. This one feels so light, so uh, nimble around the track. But that feeling going around the mid-speed corner, having uh, you know more of a balanced feeling it's not just the uh, front end that's planted, it's the whole car. Feels very advantageous in certain situations. And there's no getting past that V10 engine. 
just sounds phenomenal in any context. So a couple braking distances to uh, push forward a bit. Ran a 136.435 that time around. Decent time, not phenomenal. But again, not going for uh, lap records here. Just want to talk a little bit about how the car drives, help you get to know your GTM cars. So under braking, the car is very confident. Oh, by the way, I guess we can kick off some traction control, a little bit of ABS down. Let's see what that does for us. I have a feeling it's going to be a lot. Let's go one more down on ABS. Actually slower out of the corner that time, but only slightly. Ooh, car got a little light there. Whoa, boy. Off into the grass. That was my fault, not the car's fault, obviously. But we can throw away this lap. Now I need to be careful with this corner here because the camera's kind of funny or there's a bump in the middle of it or something. Something throws the grip off. All right, let's see if the reduced electronic assists help anything with laptop. We'll go for a full flying lap this time. Obviously no difference thus far. Able to brake a little bit later there with the reduced traction control, or ABS rather. So up three and a half tenths now. Let's see how far we can push this braking distance. That's a deceptive corner. It comes over a crest just at the last second. You feel like you should be able to see the apex, but you can't. Good so far, four tenths up. But this is the quarter that killed it last time. Can they get around cleanly this time? Not really. Lost three tenths there. That corner, that hairpin, far more about line than bravery. God, I killed myself again. Ugh. Up 0.118 seconds, and it was all in that last corner. And of course, we start this lap down now. There we go. Just about dead even with the previous best. So everything is wonderfully up to temperature now. That front left tire just doesn't want to give. It's still stuck on cold. But we're making do. We push that brake distance forward a bit. But yeah, this is just a great, great car. There we go. Oh, funny angle here. And yeah, 
car feels so confident. Let's go for one more here. See if we can end on a PV. Ooh, a little more difficulty getting around that corner than I thought there would be. And slightly unruly under acceleration there, but overall feels really, really good. second here yay somehow up a full second here so even if I throw away something in this corner which I probably will and did. Pull the inside there. So horrendous final sector. Of course, still gonna finish well ahead of the PB. And we're into the 35s. I think I will take that. So yeah, this Lanzo feels very spry by comparison to the uh, bear uh, either way they're, they're they're both great don't get me wrong but uh, i do prefer this one it just feels a little bit lighter a little bit more nimble and uh yeah it's the one that made me fall in love with the gtms initially so that's feeling still holds true uh this one's a little bit more unruly than the evo 2 but we'll get to that soon uh but yeah that's the uh, bear v10 so next up, a little bit of night driving here with my favorite car. This is the Mercer V8 based on the Mercedes. An absolutely phenomenal car. Uh, this is actually my second take of this uh, session. And the first take, I was just blubbering over this thing nonstop. And uh, I think that still holds true. So front engine, rear wheel drive. So does it have a lot in common with the Bayer? Uh, frankly, no. This is different. This one is just the most alive feeling car I think I have ever experienced in sim racing. The way the the way the tire seems to interact with the road and you feel it, you know, kind of bouncing and, you know, doing what rubber separating a, uh, you know, whatever, 1350 kilogram metal box from a hard road surface would feel like. And it just models that so beautifully. And of course that comes down to suspension as well, but uh, it's hard to really put into words just how alive and how interactive this car feels. It's just a wonderful, wonderful car in every sense. And you know, when this first came out and I was blubbering over it and I started looking around and it, it's cool to find other people feel the same. Like I'm, I'm not alone here in saying this is probably the best feeling car in all of sim racing. I know that's gonna vary person to person. There's gonna be people with, who disagree with me full stop. Um, but for me, it just doesn't get any better than this. It's just the overall just, absolutely cracking car in every sense and just delivers way more than you would expect again front engine rear wheel drive so you expect it to be sort of benign feeling like the uh like the uh bear or like the lux but it's not it feels very alive and interactive and it feels like you know your your efforts to push are rewarded and um just all your inputs are beautifully reflected and uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to really put into words how good this is. So right now I'm just running default setup. We'll start to turn some systems down pretty soon and try and extract some lap times here. But for now, I'm just sort of trying to get a feel for the car, even though, as I say, this is take two. I decided to do this one at night after all, um, or at dusk anyway. I can never get that corner right. Apologies about that. But yeah, once things are more up to temp right now i'm kind of sitting uh 25 psi all around so a little bit cold on the tires frankly uh but uh 
yeah, when I'm feeling confident, I'll start to uh, dial down those electronic assists and start to push. But suffice it to say that uh, if you have one car, if you're only able to afford uh, the one car, I would definitely recommend going with this uh, with this Mercer. Phenomenal machine. I don't know how to describe the feeling of it being alive other than the words I've already used. So if you're wondering, you know, like what makes this so different? What actually can I feel for? You have to sort of drive it to experience it. And I hate that. It's kind of a cop out answer, uh, but it's really the best I can do is that once you drive it, you probably better understand than anything I could really say here and now. A little bit down on TC. Traction control, I'm not actually too concerned about at this particular stage, but we'll see if uh, I need to dial that up a little bit later. Whoa, that was close. And yeah, the engine delivery, the power delivery in this thing is just so smooth. It's not peaky, it's not trying to kill you on corner exit. Sunshine, just about gone for the day here at Donington. Probably go for third gear, I guess, through that chicane. But this thing struggles a bit to get up from the low revs in three. But yeah, I would recommend a course like this. I don't think this would be nearly as fun at like a Monza or something like that. Um, I think you need Something like this Donington, or I'm trying to think what else. Alton Park would be a good one. Uh, Nürburgring GP would be a good one. Something with some elevation change, something with a good variety of corners. And all of these cars, by the way, something I forgot to mention, it's... Uh, Certainly exaggerated with it, well not exaggerated, but it's more obvious with the, whoa, mid-engine cars. But uh, a little stab on the brake mid-corner, which I should have done there, frankly, uh, will do a lot for you. If you're understeering, because some of them do understeer, that's for sure. And if that is the case for you, a little stab on the brake will help it rotate the car beautifully. I can feel it here in the Mercer, but again, it's more pronounced with the mid-engine cars. All right, let's try third gear through the chicane this time, see if that does anything for us. Right now, we're just about dead even. I'm gonna go one more back on the traction control, see if that helps. Whoa, and I ran too deep. Missed my braking point there, apologies about that. But yeah, just a wonderful, wonderful car. And I really feel like I could drive this all day. This, and there's another car that I can't wait to showcase for you uh, that almost equally gets my uh, blood flowing. So there's only four cars left, so you can take a guess at which one I mean. All right, let's see if we can crank out a PB here. I was like 132.5. I think we can get into the mid 130s. I think we can easily break 131. bit cleaner through there that time at the end of it anyway so far a lot cleaner here too early on the braking there and too late on the throttle it's all right Again, we're going to try and carry as much momentum through the chicane as possible, try and hold third gear. That was better. Ever so slightly better. And the brakes are nicely up to temp as well. So we're getting good brake performance. Oh, 
Oh, we're so close. Less than a tenth away from breaking into the 129s. Let's keep it going. Understeer there. I'm sure you heard that. Cost me a little bit of time, but not much. Good launch up the hill here, making up time. <laughs> that took a turn for the worse. There we go. Up three tenths now. Oops, back to second gear there for some reason. I think that shift is killing me. All right, a lot of mistakes on this lap. Let's keep it going. I know we can get below 130. This will maybe do it. Yes, technically that's it, but let's see if we can go one more cleaner. We are up time. I had to break mid corner there and it killed my momentum. But we're back to three tenths delta to the good. All right, third gear, Mike. Be brave. There we go. Much cleaner. I knew I had it in me. All right, almost a second up here. So 128.995, I'll certainly take that. But this Mercer, I mean, it just keeps giving and giving. And that little jaunt there, the little, whatever it was, eight laps. I mean, this is just a microcosm. You can have this level of fun at just about any track you want. And the car just keeps on giving and giving and it's phenomenal. I love everything about this Mercer. Uh, if you get one car, get this one. All right, four more to go. Okay, so time now for the Lux, and uh, I alluded to it earlier when I was driving the Bear, but this is also a front-engine rear-wheel drive car of sort of similar dimensions to the Bear. So, does it handle similarly? Yes, but it's a little bit more alive feeling, and we'll see that hopefully throughout the course of these few laps here at Silverstone. So it's got that big barking 5.4 liter naturally aspirated V8 engine. So we will hear that ripping down these straights. Revving out to close to 7300 RPM here. We'll get these tires warm. They tend to warm pretty quickly at Silverstone, exactly because of corners like this. <laughs> We're introducing a lot of tire friction here. And then you got these long straights as well, then heavy braking zones. So it won't take much to get these tires up to temp. But until then, we are easing our way toward the uh, Maggots and Beckett's complex here. So 
So general impressions of the Lux or things you need to know. Um, I would say that this is one slight, slight step above the bear in terms of difficulty. It seems to have a little bit more character to its driving. The bear is so point and shoot. But this one, uh, you can just feel there's a little bit more going on. Um, of course, right now I've got everything cold or just coming into temperature actually. So not gonna be a, a great judge of uh, how the car handles overall, but uh, yeah, it just kind of feels a little bit more alive to me. Feels like there's a little bit more going on. I mean, compared to the Mercer, it's light years off the Mercer in terms of feeling alive. And, uh, you know, compared to the Lanzo, totally different experience. That Lanzo V10 that I drove a few moments ago, obviously mid-engine, so it's going to handle very, very different than does this Lux. Ugly complex there for me. Things getting up there. My right tire is not looking so great. So maybe a little bit more pushing. Help get things up. Then we can start to dial down the systems and I'll give you my impressions of the car. Closer to speed. Silverstone, by the way, one of my worst circuits. I'm terrible here. Um, I'll be lucky if I can do a 203 here. <laughs> so uh, don't hold out for... Uh, anything approximating professional level uh, lap times and please don't judge the car's performance by my performance because it just simply will not be there oh understeer okay i'm gonna hold third gear here see if we got enough torque to blast us out of this complex and indeed we do so forecast lap time is falling down now into the 206 range. Again, not a course I am particularly good at. I love Silverstone, I enjoy driving it. I've just never been fast. Yeah, definitely getting some understeer here. Let me uh, dial back the traction control, see if we can improve upon that lap time at all. Oh, brutal understeer. I had to back right off the throttle there. <laughs> that was a cut that was a cut so again the the bear was so point and shoot this one uh yeah demanding a little bit more of me and i'm not uh at the point where i can give it with this lux quite yet so up uh, nearly a full second here so we're creeping down toward the 204 range. This of course with 43 liters of fuel still on board. So it's not as if I'm driving some optimized, some well optimized car, but still excuses will only take me so far here for my lackluster driving here at Silverstone. But yeah, it's a very, uh, very comfortable car. Um, if we we're ranking these cars from sort of most exciting to least exciting, this would be near the bottom of my list, I would say. I would say I even prefer the Bear. Because if you're going to, uh, whoops, fourth gear, not third. Um, if you're gonna be predictable, if you're gonna be point and shoot, be all the way that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this is trying to be point and shoot, but it's not quite there. So 
so it just ends up being somewhat of a confusing driving experience. Still ranks among, you know, the elite level of GT3 in a settle course, in my opinion, and better than 99% of any GT3s you'll drive in sim racing. But just the same, among this elite group, it's not really my favorite. Get around there. That understeer, if I could tune out that understeer, I think I would like it a lot more, but just the default setup, it is giving me a lot of understeer. But it does have really good pickup. See if we can go a little bit cleaner through here. And again, third gear should be enough. It seems like there's plenty of torque on offer here with the Lux. That you can be a little bit more uh, uh, relaxed with your with your shifting. Don't always have to try and seek out that perfect shift point shift a bit early if anything and yeah the car is really in its zone now it's starting to feel a little bit better contained 204 and change let's see if we can get that down into the 203s like I said I could. Whoa! Not like that, I won't. But yeah, tires are nicely up to temp now. So I should be able to get a little bit more out of the car. A little bit less understeery now, which is great. Let's see if I can keep it cleaner through the uh, second sector. Giving back time here. Currently still technically on pace to get into the 203s, but only barely. Oh, understeer killed me. All right, this one, yeah, I got to work with this a bit. I find that uh, this default setup, I mean, of course, the default setup, you're trying to cover everything for everyone, so it's not going to be perfect for any particular circuit. But at least here at Silverstone, just not really doing it for me. So yeah, needs work on the setup. But overall, as I say, it's a point and shoot car, but not quite on the level of the bear. But uh, yeah, very interesting here in the Lux. So just three more cars remain. Okay, so we're now on board the Lanzo Evo 2. So this, I believe, is the most technical car that uh, Race Sim Studio has released in the GTM series thus far. It just seems to check all of the boxes. I mean, listen to those sounds, and you know, it's got the big shark fin at the back, which helps, you know, stabilize it, uh, takes advantage of yaw and roll aero physics so that fin is going to be functional so it's a very very impressive car and uh, I think you'll probably hear this come through in this uh, shakedown here um, in terms of my impressions of how it drives um, I think it's 
darn near perfect. I really do. I would say that in terms of favorite, in terms of, you know, which one am I most likely to grab off the shelf and want to play with? The Mercer, but uh, this Evo 2 is a very close second. Um, so how does it drive? Well, um, it's... I don't know how to say this without sounding like a bad pun, but it's clearly an evolution of the Lanzo V10. So uh, it literally and figuratively is that, of course. Uh, the uh, Huracan Evo was the inspiration for the Lanzo V10, and this Evo 2 is the Evo 2 uh, Huracan. So obviously, improvements all around based on what they're, the engineers were able to achieve with the car, and it drives as such. It drives similar to the Evo, but uh, or the Lanzo V10, call it what you will, um, but different. <laughs> it's much more stable, and uh, so it retains a lot of the characteristics of that original Lanzo, uh, but a lot more stable in a, specifically the high-speed corners. You can really feel it like this here, even though I overshot the corner. It just feels a lot more planted. It feels like it wants to rotate better than the uh, Lanzo V10 did. So truly an achievement by Race Sim Studio, just an absolutely phenomenal machine. And again, I really feel it's among their more, even though they're a very technical team and have done some incredible things on the technical front over the years, uh, this is probably among their best. This one feels like it uh, checks so many boxes, and I could see this being a lot of people's favorite car. Even if you didn't particularly care for how it drove, the way that V10 engine screams, you know, past 7,000 RPM is just a, a, a masterwork. It really is. Cars don't really sound this good in sim racing very often, but this uh, Evo 2 just takes it to a place that I think anyone who's a fan of cars or auto racing could be nothing but satisfied with. And that buzzer sound, in case you're wondering, that, that is actually a generator that's building up pressure. So uh, the paddle shift system needs to be pressurized. There's a generator. This is my understanding. I had to look it up because I was wondering because uh, the Ford GT GTE, which is one of the worst names for a car ever, but also one of my favorite racing cars ever. Um, it has that. If you look up onboards from the Ford GT GTE, you can hear that buzzer. It's so loud in that cockpit. And I was wondering, what is that? So I had to look it up. And sure enough, is a generator building pressure for the uh, paddle shift system. So we are ending lap two. Now onto lap three. That was a 151. I'm going to go slightly back. The traction control is set quite high by default. Or sorry, uh, quite low by default. ABS is quite high by default. So I can't go down much on the traction control if I hope to safely complete a lap. But the way this car turns in is beautifully, so I kind of overshot that corner there, left my racing line. But uh, the initial turn in, which the car is responsible <laughs> for as much as I am, is wonderful. And slightly, I mean, I'm coming from the Lux, and that was just uh, giving me all kinds of problems in terms of understeer. This one is not. It's a wonderfully balanced race car. You, you, you could just drive this all day. <laughs> this is so good. And it handles the curves like it's going over nothing. You can certainly feel them through the chassis, but uh, yeah, it doesn't respond. It doesn't get twitchy like you might expect. Whoops, don't do that, Mike. Thankfully, lots of torque here, pulling me through my issues. All 
All right, three tenths up. So it doesn't look like I'm gonna get a lot of improvement here. It's just kind of steadily hanging in there around the 151 mark. Time should fall as my uh, fuel load falls, but uh, not drastically. So I'm not thinking I can break into the 140s, 149 rather. Probably stay north of one minute, 50 seconds even in best case scenario. But you never know. It is the type of car that encourages you to get a little bit faster each time. And yeah, just absolutely brilliant in how it handles these corners. Get around there. So let's see if I can not accidentally shift up into fifth gear this time. Oh, gave up back a gang of time on that hairpin. What do you know? It's faster. We don't unnecessarily shift. Let's go at least one more here. I'm starting to think more and more that I can get into the 149s. But we'll see. Just gotta keep it consistent. Do my best at every corner. Up a half second here. Oh, Mike. Not my greatest corner. Nor was that, but I am up time. Tracking for a 149.7. And I should be good to go on that. So this will be a 149.5. Just about dead. 149.477. I think I will take it with this absolutely brilliant, brilliant car. Starting to cook those uh, <laughs> rear tires, especially the rear left. I was pushing pretty hard there, but uh, more reinforcement for uh, how well these tires are modeled. It was uh, it was feeling the heat. So, uh, so brilliant. I recommend this track, by the way. See if you can beat my time. I'm sure most of you can in your sleep, but uh, yeah, that's a fun one. Works really well with the Zevo too. All right, I made reference earlier to a car that may be stealing my heart. This is the one in question. This is the Akuro, AKA the Honda NSX. And uh, I took it for some practice laps here at Road Atlanta. And I'm quickly falling in love with this car. It's funny, these uh, GTM cars, I feel like Race Sim Studio puts a little bit something extra into the cars that they know could come away as bland. I don't know, that's just a silly theory I'm working on. But uh, yeah, it just feels like the Mercer, which I thought, okay, 
whatever. We have the uh, the Mercedes in literally every sim I own. So what are they really going to do with it? And they nailed it. And then this Honda NSX, it's like, V6, come on, guys. What are we doing here? Why not give us the 720S? And then they just did something special with this Akuro. They really did. And this, by the way, a perfect showcase for it. If you happen to have this Road Atlanta mod, if not, I believe I got this for free off race department and a perfect place for the Sakuro. So still everything is cold as you'd well imagine. And so how does this Akuro drive? Well, it's mid engine, so it's got that light feeling, especially coming over this crest. Oof. That'll make you toss your cookies. That's for sure. So it's nimble around those high speed corners, but the engine is surprisingly peaky. The engine gives you power there when you need it and ends up delivering some pretty impressive lap times, actually much better than I would have expected. Whoa, even when you run off into the grass, thankfully they have runaway lanes here and nobody else is on the track, so I am good. But the way it feels coming over those curbs, it is Mercer-esque. This is a really great car, <laughs> really, really great. Just huge amounts of fun. Definitely not my favorite sounding car of the group, but uh, as far as V6 engines, are you going to do much better than this? No, not really. It's got that wastegate flutter that you can hear from time to time. Yeah, it really gets the job done. That little V6 engine mid-mounted really gets you up to speed quick. A lot to like about this engine, surprisingly. All right, so coming into our own with the Honda here. Starting to feel more and more connected with it. So we'll start to push a bit on this lap. 123.5. I'm always scared somebody's going to be coming out of the pits. Obviously, it's just practice mode, but uh, when you're actually racing here, <laughs> you got that pit lane exiting right where you're trying to cut. It's a bit dangerous feeling. Ran wide there, but that's fine. Can't remember. I feel like that's okay. And I feel like that's within track limits here at Road Atlanta, but I might be wrong. Too early on the brakes there. The braking in this thing is just absurd. I believe it's the best brakes of the group. The thing will have you kissing your windshield in no time. So forecast has me down in the low 122s, mid 122s. So it's starting to fall. I'm gonna break hard here. And still had room to spare. All right, I'm gonna try third gear for turn one. See if that helps any getting up the hill. Indeed, it seems to have. But yeah, this car is just brilliant in how it handles these bumps. Let's see if I can keep it a little bit cleaner through this section here, not run too wide on the exit. Mike, let's push. All right, I'm going to be in the 121s as it stands. We have a very light feeling car. Um, struggles a bit going up that hill, but uh, still the overall power delivery uh, feels good on flat to downhill areas. So I think it's just lacking a bit of oof up the hill. That's fine. That's why we have transmissions, isn't it? In 
something <laughs> yeah this one I think this I'm trying to think where I would rank this next to the Evo 2 maybe slightly behind I think this is definitely my top three I think I would put it behind the Evo 2, but not by much. It's very alive feeling, very spry, very fun. Cars like this are why we sim race at all. And just another example of Race Sim Studio absolutely nailing it. Too early on the brakes there. Thought I might be able to get into the 120s. But it gave back a lot of time there. Let's keep going. Hasn't been that long at track, has it? Nope, seven minutes, we're good. So if I can drop four tenths here somewhere, get down into 120s. It's so good. Oh. Yep, that's gonna kill me down this street. I was right there. I was poised to break below one minute, 21 seconds. But sadly, I will not. But as nobody famous once said, there is always another lap, or there's always next lap. Well, this is actually going to be close. Oh, 0.1 seconds. Not a great first corner. Whoa! Whew. Yeah, I should have seen that coming. All right. So now we're on a mission of revenge. My left rear tire is absolutely on fire, so I'm gonna take this lap as kind of an in-lap. Slow things down a bit, see if I can creep that temp down. <laughs> My suspicion is these tires take a while to get up to temperature. They will equally take a while to get down from temperature, but we'll see. Sitting at 103 right now, showing red. Can I creep that down? I hope so. Ah, you know what? That'll make for boring content. Let's just go with my on fire tire. One last go, see if I can break the one minute, 21 second barrier which is really no realistic barrier. It's just an arbitrary barrier. arbitrary -er. <laughs> Yeah, this isn't gonna happen. But we'll see what I can do here. Come on, Mike, let's go. Oh, already I can feel that rear end fighting back. All right, I think we have our answer. So I have more work to do on this uh, on this NSX, but I love it. I think it's a genius, genius car, but I will say it's interesting. Maybe this is something, if anyone from Racing Studio happens to see this, uh, my left rear tire is showing 105 degrees and it just will not cool. 
the tires just kind of take a while to get up to temperature. It looks like they just kind of hold there. Like I would think driving like this, it would start to cool pretty quickly. But it's sitting at 105 degrees. Could be my software, who knows? But uh, brakes seem to be cooling, but not the tires. Interesting. Um, but yeah, that is the NSX. I love it. It didn't end well here, but I love this car so much. And it's climbing my rankings for favorites. Okay, so sadly, this is the last car I get to drive as part of this video. This is, of course, the Aero, based on the Audi R8 LMS Evo 2. And even though it has a lot of its sort of underlying uh, car genetics in common with the Huracan Evo 2, uh, they are quite different driving, I will say. It's kind of like the Lux to the Bear. It's, uh, you know, you can tell the sort of underpinnings of the handling are the same. However, uh, quite different in uh, in many respects i find the evo 2 just grips so much better it's got that uh, maybe it's the shark fin maybe it's whatever else lamborghini programmed into that car slash race sim studio uh, but this one just feels a little bit more alive and maybe that's what you're going for who knows but uh, this one just feels um, a little bit more shaky whereas the evo 2 has kind of you know mid-engine characteristics but it's so planted this one has you know the expected mid-engine characteristics uh, but certainly less planted feeling but uh, still that same familiar v10 roar and uh, you know the mid-corner stability in this thing is fantastic so once things are up to temp this schumacher s should be no problem to take flat out but as of right now i'm just going to build some temperature And uh, yeah, this has been quite an eye-opening experience to, uh, you know, relive all the GTMs. Cause I, don't, I don't drive the Mayor very often, or the Bayer rather. How many times have I said Mayor? Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> I apologize for all the previous instances of me calling it the Mayor. It's the Mayor of my heart. How about that? Um, but I don't drive the Lanzo V10 all that often ever since we got the Evo 2. So it's been nice to uh, sort of go down memory lane here. And uh, even with these new cars, I mean, I'm just completely smitten with the uh, Kuro. And uh, this Arrow is excellent as well. And as is usual form, I'm just going to take some time and get everything up to temperature before I really push. This being lap two. I can uh, just start to get things kind of uh, pushing and try to build some consistent temperature through the tires hopefully not 105 degrees right now showing 72 which is good 26 degree or 26 psi at the front 25 and change at the rear and a bit of chatter through that corner not entirely finding its grip. And this car does have adjustable, this and uh, at least one other does have adjustable fuel maps. Uh, I don't think you can do it on the fly though. I do believe that's only done in the pits, which is a shame. Or can you? I don't think he can, but I could be wrong about that. I will have to double check. All right, I think we have sufficient temperature here to start pushing. Um, oh yeah, that traction control is very high. Of course, what six means in one car doesn't necessarily translate to what level six traction control means in another car. So you can't judge just by number, but uh, just as a scale, it seems like six out of nine is pretty high. Two oh one four oh nine. We're quite confident that we can break into the sub two minute range which by the way is not at all a push i think in acc i'm kind of a 
155 in quality level of driver. And if you're wondering how this car and any other cars compared to ACC, I, I just feel like it's more alive. I just feel a greater sense of connection to the car here than I do in ACC. And I know that's a bold statement. ACC in so many respects is the de facto GT3 sim and they have earned every bit of uh, respect they deserve. Kunos hit that one out of the park in my opinion. It's, I think it's a phenomenal sim. And you know the fact that it's been accepted by the real world GT3 drivers and you know you can score points using it. I mean I think speaks volumes <laughs> to uh, what Kunos has been able to achieve. But in terms of just somebody like me who just enjoys the feeling of driving, I take these over ACC. I really would. They just feel so connected, so alive. And plus, you can do so much more with them. Part of the reason, you know, ACC is so locked down is because they want to, you know, be integrated into the real world SRO Blanc Pond, call it what you will, series. And so I get that, I get from a business standpoint why they did it, but for us as drivers, I mean, we can't just throw in the latest mod. It has to be locked down. So nice to have the freedom. Great feeling GT3 cars like this in a sim like AC, excuse me, in a sim like a set of Corsa where you know, you have that freedom. You can drive this in any scenario you want. You can drive this at a track from 1920 if you want. Really up to you. Or as we know, you know, GTE is going away and GT3 Le Mans is coming in slash coming back. So you can try these at Le Mans, see what you can do. I do believe GT3 at Le Mans will be using a low downforce package, which you can't simulate in this game. But uh, yeah, either way, you can try GT3 at Le Mans. All right, so we are tracking to be comfortably under two minutes. See if we can hold that. Full tank of fuel and default setup here. So, you know, my 155s in ACC, I will not be able to match. Be curious to see if you could port over the uh, setups from ACC <laughs> into this car. Might be fun have to do a manual transfer, but I'd like to try it. So yeah, this, I was just about to say, feels more alive than does the Evo 2. And then it did that little sideways action to prove me right. So now you just have to take me at my word that that's what I was gonna say. 159 dead. All right, let's make this the last lap of the driving section of this video. So if you're a fan of the Lanzo, try the Evo 2. If you're a fan of the Evo 2, but feel it's too planted for your liking, if you like something that moves around a bit more, this arrow may be the uh, answer for you. This feels a little bit more on edge. And I know a lot of people like their cars to feel like that. So you have a little bit more play, a little bit more freedom to get the car to do what you want. I am not that guy. <laughs> I'll take all the traction I can get. So for me, it's the Evo 2. But that's not to say this is anything less than a genius car. You can tell the unbelievable level of detail that uh, Racing Studios put into this car. nearly flat. I wasn't quite brave enough. But 
but I was close. I was brave adjacent. Does that count for anything? All right, so we might be able to get it to the 58s here. It's gonna be close. That was close. Can't believe I saved that. All right, we're not going out like that, are we? Let's go one more. Is that rear tire cooking yet? 97, so yes. 80, mid 80s at the front, mid 90s at the rear. So yeah, I'm not gonna have much help from my uh, rear tires on this lap. It's not to say that a personal best is not possible, though. So up slightly here, just about a tenth. Lost the sunshine. Thankfully, I have my lights turned on. Flat. Almost. Oh, and I lost it. Ah, I can't take it flat. Not with that line, anyway. Again, this is gonna be close. Dead even or one one hundredth of a second off my personal best. Can I keep it clean around here? Oh, and then just unnecessarily ran into the grass. I think this is fate telling me to wrap it up and bring this long, long video to a close. But uh, yeah, this was huge fun. All these cars are brilliant. So to wrap things up on this unofficial owner's guide for the GTM cars, I absolutely love the cars and I think everyone who has the capability to own these, enjoys sim racing, enjoys GT3, should absolutely drive them. Um, I fall a little bit more in love with them every time I drive them. You realize subtleties of one car to the next. To know that there is more coming really just makes me happy because there's a lot of great cars. I can't imagine what uh, Racing Studio will be able to do with a 720S or the Porsche or the 296. I think there's a lot of exciting things to come. Hopefully, I mean, this is an owner's guide, not a review. You. So hopefully showing you things about the cars in the first half of the video. And if you don't yet own the cars, uh, hopefully the second half of the video has helped inform you about what you can expect. Kind of pivoted in the middle there inadvertently, but uh, hopefully it helps. So this has been a really, really fun one to film and uh, to record. Rather, I keep saying film. It's been a really, really fun one to record. And I just, you know, have to give a massive shout out to Race Sim Studio for the incredible work they've done on these cars. And they're just more and more fun every time I drive them and I look forward to what the future holds with the GTM cars. RacingStudio.com is the website should you choose to buy any of these cars. I'm not affiliated with them in any way. I don't gain anything if you buy the car or don't. I just wanted to share my thoughts and uh, hopefully help those of you who already own the cars to uh, get a little bit more out of them. So that's going to do it. I'm going to wrap it there. Thanks so much for watching. Incredibly long video. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time.